Good morning. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, 22 edition of our symposium. Um, a special welcome to the members of uh, Medicus Mundi International. So I'm glad that uh, we are so numerous, all the seats are taken. That's a very good sign. Um, the world in crisis, climate change, war, we could add uh, others, uh, pollution, extinction of species, deforestation, not only in the Amazonas, by the way, also in Africa, even more uh, empty forests, empty seas, and so on, you name it. So all this uh, crisis dominate the headlines of, uh, of the media and the discourse also, and maybe also uh, us and our mood. The, um, it is uh, tempting to move away from optimism. It's also tempting to refuge into cynicism by all this uh, crisis hopping. And uh, the question is, do we need crisis to progress? We see with uh, the war in Ukraine that now the Western countries at least are accelerating uh, in uh, moving away from uh, fossil fuel or that COVID accelerated the development of uh, new vaccines. But uh, this is maybe only media driven. I think there are optimistic people looking for solutions, not only being driven by the uh, crisis. It's understandable somehow. Uh, the procrastinators among us, they understand that uh, the, the more the deadline approaches, the more energy flows into, into a solution. Uh, of a problem. Yeah. Now, um, well, I forgot what I wanted to say. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we, ha we have seen that uh, all these crises, they have also an impact on health, of course. And uh, we have uh, amazing uh, presenters and uh, I'm excited to hear how they respond to the crisis, what was the impact on the crisis, and uh, I, I'm sure that we will have a diverse and inspiring symposium. And I hand over to Martin for the moderation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, René Steyerli, president of the Network Medicus Mundi Switzerland. I welcome all of you here in the, in the room and around the world on our online uh, streaming of this conference. I am Martin Leschon, I'm the, I'm the director of the Network Medicus Mundi Switzerland. And together with Sarah Traoré and with Amelie Strebel, Strebel who is uh, responsible for our online uh, participants, we will guide you through the day today. Until the launch, we will focus on the one global mega crisis that is threatened to be neglected by other crises at the moment. The climate degradation is threatening the existence of life, of the life of our planet. What does this mean for actors in global health? And what does it mean for people around the world, for ex example in Uzbekistan? And we will ask in this first session as well, how does policymakers here in, t in a town like Basel in the global north react uh, to on this global threat? We expect to come in this first session as well, Beat Jans, the president of the government of the canton of Basel-Stadt, um, but he uh, will arrive just a little bit um, later. He had to reschedule some things, so we rescheduled a little bit the first session. 
So we come to our first speaker, we come to our first presentation. I'm glad to hand over to Remco van der Pass, who will start to talk about health within its planetary boundaries. Is it enough to adapt on different levels to find more resilience in our projects and programs to improve health conditions? Or is our health system part of, of the system of economic growth that has led us to do today's situation. Remco van der Pass is a research associate at the Center for Planetary Health Policy in Berlin. Until tomorrow, he is as well member of the board of Medicos Mundi International. Remco, good to have you here. Thank you, Martin, and uh, uh, very pleasant to be here uh, all with you and that I can kick off this uh, symposium and setting the scene a little bit. Um, so yes, um, uh, happy to be here also after several years of doing working uh, online and to be in present discussing an, uh, an important matter. And, uh, and the matter that I will, will put up for discussion is that if we really are serious about dealing with this multiple crisis, then we need to think about our model of economic development and how we want to alter that or not, and what we as actors working in international health cooperation can do. So I'm a public health physician, worked for NGOs, then worked uh, in Belgium and the Netherlands in, uh, in academia, and moved to um, uh, now working to a, to a think tank in, in Berlin. Uh, and that's interesting because I, then you look, then I could look from different perspectives to certain problems. And uh, where, I'm, where I am now is called the Center for Planetary Health Policy, which is affiliated to the German Alliance on Climate and Health. So it's a new alliance on climate and health problems. Um, and then everybody, everybody asks, so what's this new paradigm? What's this planetary health thinking? How does it differ from global health or one health, etc.? For me, it's very simple. Um, planetary health is working on public health, but just recognizing these ecological planetary boundaries that we need to respect. But in the end, we are working on the same justice and health system strengthening like we did before. But we really need to question the, um, the development and economic drivers behind it. So that's what I will uh, talk with you about today. And let me keep a little bit my notes. Um, so it's, a, it's, an, it's an introduction, it's, a com it's of course complex, so um, it's, up for it's, uh, it's, it's something we can discuss further, and I will write uh, this also down for the, for the bulletin. Um, what we see now with, this, uh, with, these, with these multiple crises is that there are these waves of problems. So we, we, we come out of a pandemic, or are uh, still in a, in a pandemic, and at the same time, we have economic inequities, and there's the energy crisis, there's a war, and then there's this looming, protract protracting climate and biodiversity uh, problems that we see. But they're unfolding quite, uh, quite rapidly. Uh, and I think everywhere people are, at least I am at loss, uh, politicians are at loss, how to, how to, how to relate to that in a, in a, in a constructive way. Because that original, I think, development ideal where much of us are working with is not, it's not sometime, somehow it's not really working anymore. Or the expectations to there that we can all rise and reach a certain level is really, be, is really being channeled by, um, by these crises. Hmm? Um, and so when reflecting on that, and that was maybe the good thing about the pandemic, that you had time to sit down and, and read a bit and, and think about it. Um, when reflecting about it it, it, it occurred to me that it's interesting to, to look back and, and, and look a little bit what had been taught before, also to provide lessons for, for the future. And one of the main thing, main, um, books and thinking that occurred uh, 50 years ago and that is now uh, also being um, being presented is, is the, whole lim the whole limits to growth thinking. There's quite some attention now by the Club of Rome of 50 years of 
uh, of the limits to growth and what it, uh, what it uh, implies. But the limits to growth, and I don't know how well uh, you are uh, familiar with, uh, with the publication, uh, I think because uh, of, the, of the generations present here, uh, you really you might have uh, touched touched upon it, but the limits to growth public the limits to growth publication was was the the thinking that occurred 50 60 years ago, stimulated by scientists, um, NGOs, but also people from from business that if you really if you really matched the um, several components together, then um, the, the, the economic drive and industrialization and, gro and population growth and food expansion, if that, if, that would if that would expand over time, then you would come to a, then you would come to a, to a problem. The predicament of mankind, they called it. Hmm? The, the problematic, if you, um, if you look at things in a systematic way, in a complex, adaptive, systematic way, then problems interrelate and on a more planetary scale it might cause problems that you don't see on the day-to-day -day practical level. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of feedback mechanism, a kind of what they call in economics externalities or side effects that we don't take into consideration but that as a, as a boomerang effect return. Mm -hmm. And that thinking that was facilitated also by at that moment, the first computer, mod computer models to, um, to provide some scenarios led to, the, to this publication of the Limits to Growth. And the Limits to Growth publication, basically this is one of the, the main models of the Limits to Growth, where they had five basic variables, which is about food and, uh, and resources, resources be meaning fossil fuel, or other energy resources, minerals, etc. Um, and if you take population and po uh, pollution into account, then you would see at a, mo a kind of a, an optimum of economic development, of industrialization, and afterwards this would decline, with, of course, large impacts also on um, food availability, mm -hmm. the, pop the possibility for populations to thrive, um, which is quite scary, but the thinking was, okay, if we, if we anticipate on it, then we can at least steer it in a direction that it's more, uh, uh, more just and equitable and, and, and manageable oriented than if, we just if, than if the, the system would collapse. Um, thinking about if and reading about um, that projections, um, it's interesting to... to to consider why didn't we really act? Huh? If already people 50 years ago quite clearly foresaw th these, pro these problems coming ahead that we're talking about in this symposium, why didn't we really act uh, from a policy perspective? Now, um, the, the people that made these projections were being put away a little bit as scaremongering, and they were put away by uh, saying, look, we have enough resources, we're innovative, we have the, the green agricultural revolution, so um, we'll, we'll find the ways to uh, postpone this to happen, and we can, we can if we're, if we're crea creative, creative enough, we can deal with, these, uh, uh, with, this, with this problem. Um, of course, it was, these were scenarios. Huh? It's, not a, it's not a prediction. But the latest calculations that are now done by some researchers 50 years later say, well, actually, they were quite right when it came to resource depletion, or what they call peak oil in the ecological science. Hmm? Um, so it's, it's a warning sign that we need to take still very, very serious. But at the same time, it also it, the, it challenged us to think about the economic development model. It's in the end, it's about growthism and the way how we see economic growth or consider growth as equating with human progress, which is very strange because in the end, economic growth is 
about the production and the consumption of goods, which is very physical, there are very physical resources, there's energy, and that has its limits. But we, we wanted to expand and, and think that if we just expand enough and then if we distribute it enough, it will, it will benefit humanity. Around that time, well, there was also the, the thinking from, from Ivan Illich and others who challenged us a little bit also, and they, they, do not only, they, they did not only say there's limits to growth, but also limits to medicine uh, in itself. Because medicine, um, what happens is that we, in, in a medicalization of society, we hand also over autonomy uh, of our, how we organize our, our health and well-being. We, we become dependent on, uh, on the medicine that we, um, well, that, that, we have, that we have developed, but because the medicine is developed by certain, by people who have interest to, uh, to expand it, to make markets out of it, um, we, hand, we hand over our own autonomy to deal with medical problems that we have. It's a kind of, a, he calls it a, 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 a monolithic religion. Um, not only medicine, but in general, the, um, let's say the, um, the biosciences, uh, in a sense that we, um, by relying on, for instance, opioids and antimicrobial resistance, uh, anti, anti, uh, antimicrobial drugs, we become, um, so to say, later in life when we, when we, when we get disease, we, we, are, we have to rely on those that provide us those drugs. Huh? And we in the development scene always want to have uh, universal access to medicines, etc. But we've seen with the COVID crisis and in our health systems, that's far from the case. Huh? And even Illich basically, basically says, said, um, so with these, with these side effects, we create a kind of iatrogenesis. Huh? Um, th it's the it's the the health system itself that is creating ill is creating ill health, and I think we need to consider this very seriously. I know you're all working in international health. Think about the projects you're in and how much of these projects here in Western Europe and somewhere else is actually iotrogenetic, iot iot huh? um, because we have the um, we have the antimicrobial resistance. Um, because we, and I'm not against vaccination and diagnostics, etc., but we overload health systems so much with, uh, with biomedical um, tools that the capacity and the basics actually get, um, they implode, so to say. Hmm? So we need to simplify. That's my main mes message for today. We need to learn to simplify, go back to the basics, go back to basic uh, uh, primary health care, and, and do that really also at the, the household and community level. Hmm? Now, so now the, the um, let's say the, the genie is out of the bottle and we somehow need to get that uh, genie back in the bottle. So I give you some examples about how things spiraled out of control and then give some ideas how to put that back in. This is from, um, from Sierra Leone during the Ebola epidemic. Um, we work uh, with with a colleague from the ITM, from the Institute in Antwerp in, in Guinea on health system strengthening post Ebola, and here you see a um, I have to stand here I understood here you see the, um, a, a boy that is that will, that has been taken to an uh, Ebola treatment center against his own will huh? because we we need to be safe and uh, for for health security reasons this boy need to be together with his family contained because otherwise Ebola could spread. But it's against his own willingness. That's a very strong uh, picture. Behind it, though, is the, uh, is, is the question, why did Ebola emerge there in the first place in, uh, in West Africa? And why did Ebola emerge in, in Central African places um, as it is now in, in Uganda? And the agricultural um, and ecological scientists um, who did some tracing said, well, actually, it has really a lot to do with 
the clearing of the land and the land conversion and the palm oil plantations and the industrialization and opening of the, of the land that enabled um, pathogens to cross from one species to the other. Hmm? So it's also our development model that enabled such a situation to happen. Hmm? And we visited also palm oil plantations in, in, in the forest region of, Gu of Guinea where the Ebola outbreak took place. So we're working a lot on the effects of things, and this is the one health of, uh, approach of surveillance and then organizing diagnostics, but we fail to intervene or question that uh, development uh, or industrial approach where agricultural is being opened in uh, biodiverse lands. Now, the same can be said a little bit about um, I'm from the from the Netherlands, which is a which is a very uh, in, in dust in intensive farm uh, occupied uh, 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 land, where at the moment uh, there's a lot of avian uh, influenza outbreaks taking place in um, in poultry farms. The last three months, um, more than 43 million uh, chicken have been killed to uh, keep the uh, the the avian influenza outbreaks out of. Um, uh, trying to, to prevent it further. But once again, the solution is then monitoring and, uh, and, and also um, developing vaccines against avian influenza, rather than talking about, hey, shouldn't we reduce this intensive farming in the first place? Do we need to eat so much um, animal proteins at all? And the same can to an extent be said about the, the, the medicines and the vaccines that, are, that have been developed, not only for COVID-19, but for many other diseases. Do we really need that so much vaccines at all to boost our immu Im Im immunity? Or is this really also about, um, is it really also not about the basics and being in, in good health and in nutrition to deal with um, infectious diseases in the first place? We've become reliant on it. And we even push it in our development model. And here I'm quite critical. We push it to places where it's really not a priority. COVID-19 vaccination, out of the whole debate about COVID equity, was it needs to be available all across the world. But I would say that in many African places, actually COVID-19 vaccines didn't really had a, uh, uh, a real need because people didn't really fell ill and wa were not really at risk. They are risk at other for other diseases, for malaria, etc. But not COVID-19. But because of our own health security, we had to push a, uh, those vaccines to the rest of the world. Moreover, those vaccines were produced by companies who have intellectual property over it, and who made huge loads of profits in doing so. And then the question is, where are where are organizations fit within that model? Hmm? What do we challenge, and how do we? What do we promote? Do we promote more the therape therapeutic biomedical side, or can we promote more basic public health actions? Now, this is where I where I will um, end and where we can discuss, so to say. And that is some proposals that are now being um, um, be being being made. So, in the ecological in the ecological economics field, there is the whole notion about post-growth or degrowth. I don't know how many of you are um, known to that thinking, but the basic, the basic idea in post-growth is that um, we need to reduce our um, energy output. Hmm? If economic growth is so much linked to the consumption and production of goods, basically to, uh, economic ex uh, to energy expansion, um, then we need to try to contain that. And uh, there's a lot of, in, you would say, people who, will, who believe in green growth or in technological innovation, they say, okay, you can decouple it. You can decouple your resource use, resource use from the actual uh, economic growth. Huh? We, can still have, uh, we can still have growth, but using much less energy. But post-growth people say this is, this is a fallacy to think so. If we really would like to sustain our, if we really want to reduce um, 
our, our energy output here and then to stay within the, um, within the 1.5 degrees that is needed to, to deal with climate change. And if we still want to have uh, other places in the world to be able to develop economically, then we need to... Um, then it's a little bit unavoidable also to here in Europe um, reduce our um, basically all the stuff that we have. And that's, that's a difficult one, because then we really need to transform the way how we organize, how we live, um, how we um, basically how we produce our, our energy uh, in the household, um, how we organize our, our, our work on a day-to-day -day level, including in the, how we organize our health systems. Someone like uh, Bruno Latour, who just passed away two months ago, the great French um, philosopher, asked the question, where do we land? How do we land uh, on an earth where we cross so much ecological uh, boundaries? And basically he says, we need to learn to be much more grounded, li literally, literally. We need to become more terrestrial. We need to learn much more to pay attention to the, to the local and to the day-to-day needs in our communities and learn also about the differences there. And then in the in international health cooperation, this is linked to when we work with communities and with people, do we really learn and understand also how they uh, over um, centuries have managed within their, within their worldviews to deal th with the problems that they have, rather than that we try to make coherence and make everything global according to global standards, etc. Um, and in the in the in the care economy or in the in the post growth community, they are talking the way to do this, they say we need to talk about uh, care economies, meaning that health systems, the way they are now, whether here in, in Europe or elsewhere, they have become way too complex. They have become dependent on uh, on laboratory technologies on CT scans, etc. But the material for these for these goods, they're they're they are they are limiting. They are ending at one moment. So we need to learn to do much more with less, and produce health also um, much more. For instance, at home, where we support people to take care of the elderly, of uh, of, uh, of relatives who are ill to work with friends, rather than that we rely on, on the physicians uh, where we come with, our, with all our mental health problems. So it means scaling down. And yet, in the end, it's an ethics of self-imposed limitation. And I think I will leave it there, and we can keep discussing uh, further. Thank you. Thank you. You can stay here. Um, thank you very much, Remko. Uh, always inspiring to listen to you. We think about, you started with a quite radical way of thinking, as well um, for, our own, uh, for our own sector. I just want to ask if there are one or two or three remarks, just short statements or, or not questions. We can deal with questions afterwards, but do you have statements? Do you want to react directly on it? You know, I'm always walking through the room, and for those online, it's a little bit difficult because they cannot see me anymore. <laughs> Cecilia. Ciao. Hi, thank you very much. Cecilia from Enfant du Monde. I, I find it very inspiring. Thank you. Just to say, we go back to health promotions. Uh, uh, and uh, it seems to me we are going back to something that uh, seems old, but is actually new. So health promotion is the basics. Uh, and will become again the basics. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Other short statements on this, what you've heard. You're not awake yet, I think, but you should be. Christina, the priest of Co from Cordate. Thank you. Uh, th thank you, Rempo, for um, this presentation. I would just like to make a remark that the effects of growth are mainly from northern industrialized yes. countries, so it's our responsibility. And you could think that you also want to uh, limit the growth of 
countries that are um, not responsible for this whole climate change effects and, and uh, the limitations of growth. So I just wonder if we should have another message actually for non-industrialized countries. Thanks. Yes, this is so that to be very clear, the post-growth thinking is, is part of a broader global approach and linking between social movements where it's very much a European approach. So it's not so much something to be imposed somewhere else, but we need to work with others and learning also how they, from a decolonial perspective, try to improve and promote health. So there's a lot of learning and reciprocality, I think, to be done. Um, sorry, you? Okay, then we do the zipper version, male, uh, female, and but this is all Medicus Mundi International here. Uh, hi, thank you, Ranko, for your presentation. Just one reflection. Uh, yeah, it's true, in Europe we have more responsible than in the South, but uh, here we have also problems of equity. And who is going to be affected more for the measures that we can take uh, for this uh, crisis will be the poorest. They are the unhealthy in our countries also, and they are the people who are not uh, chances to, I mean, maybe it's, it's something exaggerated, but who can be really ecologists in our countries? Higher class media, because it's expensive. So in, in this, in this uh, context of, of um, working here in Europe, we must to take account also about equity in the measures with the, with the poorest. We have to think about what we do offer to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. You don't have to react now. We have now afterwards the debate. I just take these two or three voices that are still around. Um, this was, by the way, Carlos uh, of Medicus Mundi Spain and uh, president of Medicus Mundi International. Uh, there is something, uh, there was something in, uh, coming in from the chat, Amelie. It's a question, um, how would an economist of the Ministry of Interior, including businesses, would respond to Remco's statements? Can you react on this question? They would, say, they would say that I am not realistic and that they would, that I, that they would need growth also to create jobs and to have the fiscal space to, all to, or to finance healthcare and schooling, etc. But I would say, if you, if, you, if you look at this limits to growth graph, and you think then realistically about what is going to happen, then we cannot, uh, we can, we cannot allow this economic growth and acceleration to continue. Huh? Or, we with, or we will hit very hard a certain wall. We rather now very quickly slow down and then organize it in a democratic way, or it will go very hard, and that will become that then then it will lead to quite a lot of conflict. Hmm? So that will be a little bit my response. It's about opening up political alternatives for something that is unavoidable. Thank you very much. I would now suggest that we continue. We will have afterwards uh, in this session as well the, the possibility to go on with the debate. Uh, but it's great that you have already reacted and that you are certainly awake here. Uh, I want to invite now um, Astrid Knoblauch. Uh, she's here in the, in the saal to the, to the floor. Astrid is an epidemiologist at the Swiss TPH. Uh, she has a strong expertise in assessing and monitoring the impact of large-scale infrastructure projects located in Sub-Sahara Africa. Astrid is here in the room. She's here. <laughs> and we have at the same time as well uh, on the... Um, uh, here, just a moment, I need... We have as well, uh, not on the floor, but already here in the via Zoom with us, as well in the, in the room, uh, Gulara Afandieva, as well working for the Swiss TPH. Gulara joins us via Zoom from Uzbekistan. Uh, she is a public health specialist with a advanced MBA degree in health finance 
and economics. She has a broad set of experience in healthcare, health reforms, and has done consultancies for World Bank, the Global Fund, SDC, and other global health institutions. Both will speak about effects of environmental, environmental degradation on public health and human rights in the RLC region. Researchers of the Swiss and Tropical Health Institute have examined the impact of hydrological changes at the, at the Aral Sea. Let us hear the results by Gulara and Astrid. Thank you very much. I hand over. You need this. Now? Yeah. Good. And I have to stand here? Here? In the light. Good. <laughs> okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure for me and Gulara to be here today. We're going to talk about the effects of environmental degradation on public health and human rights in this Aral Sea region. Thanks, uh, Martin, for the introduction. There was just a small mistake. <laughs> Gulara is actually currently in Baku in Azerbaijan uh, and not in Uzbekistan, but that's not a problem. She will present to us remotely. Now, we first want to just give you a little bit of context and background of the Aral Sea region because it's a, a very interesting setting, but also a very challenging setting, as you will see. Now, let's go to Uzbekistan. It's... Um, it's, the, it's called the place of the Uzbek people, which is the local uh, ethnic majority in the region or in the country. Now, the Aral Sea is located in the somewhat northwestern part of the country. Um, it is a shared region with Kazakhstan, the neighboring country. Now, Uzbekistan is a former Soviet country, which means they have uh, administra administrative regions, which are called oblasts. But then they also have these semi-autonomous regions. And um, one of the, or the biggest actually, semi-autonomous region in Uzbekistan is called the Republic of Karakal, Pakistan. And this republic is also the least uh, populated republic. And it is located in the northwestern part of the country where also this Aral Sea is located. Now, in the 1960s, the Aral Sea was, as that's like 60 years ago only, it was the fourth largest freshwater lake in the world. Then in the 1960s, um, massive agricultural and irrigation projects have started, mainly for the production of uh, cotton. And this means that... Um, Basically, the effluent rivers into the Aral Sea were no longer um, transporting these massive amounts of water into the Aral Sea, and the Aral Sea surface was uh, reducing year by year. So over the years, uh, the surface was decreasing, and it basically led also a bit to the desertification of this area. Um, at the highest, the sea could drop, could have a water level drop by up to one meter in just one meter in just one year. So uh, nowadays, or even by the 1990s, the Aral Sea has shrunk to only about uh, so less than 10 percent of its original surface. And as you can see on on these pictures, it basically led to the desertification of the entire. Um, uh, your area, and at the same time, it meant that the salinity levels in the remaining water has increased. This is how the Aral Sea looks like uh, nowadays. Um, basically, within you know the entire area where you formerly had a green and lush area, you now have very sparse uh, vegetation, and these plants are adapted to this dry and saline environment. Now what happened with the agricultural project is that they also used a lot of uh, fertilizers, pesticides, insecticides, and these were then all washed into the Aral Sea with this effluence river. And as the water level was depleting, 
these uh, toxic agrochemicals became exposed at the Lake Bassin. Now, nowadays and since a long time, heavy storms and, uh, and heavy winds are now carrying this dust, the sand, the toxic materials and these natural salts across the uh, entire region in a radius of several hundred kilometers. And this further uh, contributes to the desertification of the area and also has other, uh, general impacts on the environment and on human health, as we'll come back to you uh, just later on that. Then aside this environmental degradation, we also had this socio-political dynamics and economic dynamics. Basically, with the shrinking of the sea, um, the, some industries couldn't maintain any longer. For example, the fishery industries or also the agricultural industry, the cotton production. This led to huge outmigration of the area, and that included also outmigration of skills, including in the health sector. Left behind was basically a population that was more vulnerable and didn't have the means to leave. Now, the Aral Sea, as you can imagine, it was evidently in need for national support. But now we have this um, situation with the semi-autonomous republic, which leads to certain tensions with the national uh, government and whenever the people, as the population of the Aral Sea region, they ask or demand for better rights, including health care, these demands are actually um, handled very oppressively. So whenever there's a protest or something, these are crashed down and this leads to frequent states of emergency in the Aral Sea region. Yes, and on top of this whole disaster, we have the global climate change. Um, the global climate change basically means that there are hotter summers, colder winters, longer droughts, and um, yeah, more intense dust storms. But then also the dying of the Aral Sea itself has led to you know, microclimatic changes in the area. So we have le less uh, air humidity, which means less rain. This in turn means that the... Um, uh, growing season was much shorter, which then impacts on the local food availability. So <laughs> this is a bit just a very short and a superficial overview of, of this setting, which is very challenging. And now Gulara will um, present to you what we did, the assessment, its approach, and also its findings. Yes, thank you very much, Astrid. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, from sunny Azerbaijan. And I will tell you now in more detail about the study conducted in the ROC region and the result, uh, results obtained. Yes. I don't see the presentation, sorry. <laughs> Us neither. It's back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And with the main goal to assess the health and human rights impacts of uh, the environmental degradation in RLC region, we conducted an analysis of the primary and secondary data to quantify the burden of diseases and assess uh, the effects of the environmental degradation and climate change on population health. We also assessed available human resources, infrastructure, and equipment in the healthcare system. Uh, we evaluated the population access to healthcare services as a human rights. And finally, we proposed investments opportunities for the RLC region to the Ministry of Health of the Republic of Uzbekistan and for KFW, which is the donor. Uh, to achieve this objective, uh, we had several data collections activities. Uh, this gave you approach to analyze health data uh, from the Ministry of Health and any other available scientific gray literature. Uh, we conducted health facility assessment in 54 facilities in RLC region. 
We did key informant interviews with health facility managers and health workers, and we conducted focus group discussions with community members about the environmental and social determinants of health. We have collected a lot of data, but here we just presenting a selection. Analyzing the population morbidity data and correlation of the data with the environment de degradation showed us that the burden of non-communicable diseases was steadily increasing over the past decades. And this trend is predicted to continue. More frequent dust storms and increasing air pollution levels pose a risk to respiratory system, including decreased lung function and increased asthma symptoms. The inhalation of the toxic materials in the dust also leads to the hypertension, heart disease, stroke, and also overall mortality. Increased temperatures and the more frequent and more intense heat waves are posing a risk to cardiovascular health, particularly for the elderly and people with pre-existing conditions. The high salinity, high salinity of drinking water and additional salt intake from foods lead to morbidity of kidney and urological conditions. Due to the high exposure of the residents of the RLC region by carcinogenic substances through air, soil, and water, an increase of the cancer, modulity, uh, uh, cancer morbidity was registered. Uh, local perceptions align greatly with the findings from literature. Almost all community members mentioned the widespread oil, air, soil, and water pollution, high salt content of drinking water, and the poor socioeconomic situation of the population. This socioeconomical situation is characterized by high rates of unemployment, increasing poverty, and stress related to high levels, levels of migration and dependency of remittances. However, these remittances have been severely disrupted during the pandemic time. This picture uh, shows a typical primary health care facility in the Republic of Karakal, Pakistan. This is the place where patients would go for the first kind of contact with the primary health care. As I mentioned above, one of the most critical health issues in the, in the ROC region is the increasing of number of cancer cases among the population. Uh, what this diagram shows is that there is a discrepancy between the burden of diseases and the number of specialists, as well as type of services for the diseases which become more prevalent. Water availability is as an inch inch region also is challenges for the health facilities. From the diagram, you can see that only about half of healthcare facilities have water piped into the facility. But at the same time, the water cuts are quite frequent. The other facilities uh, rely on alternative sources, but don't correspond that don't correspond to the essential sanitary norms because of high in contamination risk. And uh, uh, for the healthcare waste management, uh, the main way, way of the waste proposal is the ma ma is muffled furnace. The dust from this burning is causing additional air pollution for the surrounding environment. On the next, on this slide, you can see the typical example of the muffled furnace in the Republic of Karakal, Pakistan. Uh, we will now conclude uh, with our main outcomes and uh, brief outlook. As output of the assessment, we recommended that the investments have uh, a focus on non-communicable diseases 
as this represents the main burden of disease and are expected to increase further due also to the environmental and social risk factors. The strengthening of specialized services on secondary and tertiary level to treat these communi non-communicable diseases appropriately. A focus on primary health care and integrated care because prevention and early diagnosis happen at the first level of care. As we know, reducing the burden of disease in the first place is much more cheaper than later cure in, on the higher levels. And also they are offering uh, these services at the primary care level means that they are more accessible geographically and financially for the population which is contributing to the human rights approach. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me and I pass uh, again the floor to Astrid. Yes, I'm just going to conclude. So we really see that environmental degradation, climate change, economic hardship, social and political issues, they're all sort of interlinked and they really represent a very complex challenge for the RLC region. We also see that access to healthcare, uh, especially for the most pro prevalent diseases and access to healthcare is a human right, is not really guaranteed for this population in the RLC region. There is, however, somewhat a positive outlook. This uh, RLC disaster or crisis has now really reached a level of international attention. And there are a lot of big or heavy um, reform processes going on in the country, including, for example, in the water sector, but also in the health sector. And uh, this is basically supported by heavy international investments. Yes, so that is just some uh, slight hope at the end of the horizon for the population of the and the environment of the Aral Sea region. Thanks. I think we leave it here for the moment. The debate comes later. Thank you very, mu very much, Gulara. Thank you very much, uh, Astrid, for this in, in, um, really nice um, <laughs> for this really nice presentation and interesting presentation. Now in the sequence as well of this uh, morning, we heard first uh, Remco van der Pas with a with a with uh, ref reflections going quite to the to the base of our systems, how we ought we have to do in changing the systems we are in. We heard now what climate change, uh, climate degradation, environmental problems causing in a region like the RLC. It's an extreme example, I think, uh, but uh, I think it's as well something all of you working in the field of international health cooperation are confronted with in different places of the world. From the world, now here to Basel, uh, so let's stick where we are. Uh, I welcome the president of the government of the canton of Basel Stadt. Some would call him our mayor, but he's not. As someone from Rien, I can tell you he's as well our president, not only the one of those in the town of Basel. Um, Beat will explain how his government is assessing Basel's responsibility to contribute in the climate protection for its population and in a global context. Beat Jans holds a diploma in agriculture engineering and is an environmental scientist. Before his election as president, Beat was vice president of the Social Democratic Party Switzerland and member of the Swiss Parliament. Beat, thank you very much for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, let me start with thanking you. It's great that you come together here in Basel and that you, as experts from all over the world, 
put your time, effort, and expertise into solving these uh, enormously challenging crises that we face. The title of my speech was Basel Stadt in a World in Crisis. It's not, it's not really appealing. <laughs> I mean, there's little Basel and there's the world and there is these huge crises. And I noticed that lots of people um, are getting sick of hearing about crisis. I mean, last week I met a very important economic leader in the region. He's the head of a huge corporate organization. And he said, Beat, what's wrong with this world? I can hardly bear these negative news all the time. And people are getting weird. Even Elon Musk loses his mind. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> So, this feeling of, wow, it's getting too much, is everywhere. But I think it's very important that we don't let us, um, that this message doesn't stop us. Because it's, it's so incredibly important that we keep on doing what we can do that we do the right thing, and that we don't give up. Um, let me give you an example where it took decades to realize that we did the right thing. Sometimes, decades later, we, we realize maybe it was, not, it was the wrong decision but sometimes we're absolutely sure it was worth the effort. And I tell you a story which has a lot to do with my city. Uh, is there anybody in here who has been in Basel in the summer? Please raise your hands. Uh-huh, quite a lot of them, but the other ones, let me tell you what makes Basel very special in summer. It is the river. You can swim in the river of Basel. It is beautiful. It's, it's great. It's, 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 it became our best place to be. It was, it's as popular as the soccer stadium. But that was not the case when I was a child. Uh, the administration told us, warned us, don't go swimming there, it's not healthy. So nobody did, pretty much. And why now it's absolutely possible? Why is the Rhine clean enough to be a place to be for everybody? It was the right decision, made by the Swiss parliament in the 80s. And they said, let's stop with this wastewater going down the river. Let's stop it. Let's ban it. And at the same time, decide financial and political ways to achieve the goal. Right? That was, it, was a, it was a very radical decision at that time. And because Switzerland was the first country to do it, there was no model around. And of course, there was huge resistance, right? I mean, the industry said, come on, this is, this is going to be a big disaster for Switzerland as a production site. You know, extra costs, you know, disadvantages, all is going to end bad. So let's not do it. That's what they said. And today, the same people, they make advertisements because they need the people, they need, they need people from all over the world. And they put the Rhine saying, we have quality of life, you know. This is, this is how things can change. And today, nobody, nobody regrets that decision anymore 
because it was also in favor of the whole production side. Switzerland was not a disadvantage, it was an advantage because Switzerland is now leading, world leading in wastewater treatment technology. It's a full success. We didn't know that at that time. And for me, it's, it's such a wonderful story because I live it every day when I go swimming there. I know it was good, it was the right thing to do. And now we're in this situation where we have the pandemic, where we have the war, where we have the climate crisis. What's the right thing to do? And I tell you, the pandemic and the war in Ukraine hit all the governments here in Europe by surprise. Some people may have known it, but the governments didn't. And it, it was, it's very difficult to, to be in an executive position in, in such a situation because you're always more or less fishing in the dark. You're trying to be on top of the information, but you always know you have to take decisions before you know the consequences, before you can really, uh, be before you have the full information and, and the clear idea how where the development goes. So it was, it's, it was incredibly challenging. And we, can, we tried to do what we could, but it's not, it's not um, over yet, and it's still worrying for all of us. But with the climate situation, it's different. We cannot say that we were you know, caught by surprise. I studied 30 years ago, environmental sciences, and my professors said exactly the same thing as the, as the professors say now. They s it was maybe a bit less dramatic at that time, but they said it, it's gonna come. All the consequences that we're now starting to see, to feel, they predicted. But there was no response from politics. A little bit. You may know um, that Jimmy Carter was the first one to do something about it. He put solar panels on the White House. It was probably more symbolic, but it was a very important symbol at the time. His successor, of course, took it back down. And then, Jim, and then Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton is the one who said, when he was still in power, he said, nothing threatens civilization more. There's no other development that thre threatens to end civilization than the climate warming. And he did something, but of course, his successors destroyed it. Now, I think it's important to do again the right thing and do it consequently. And what can a city like Basel, what can a city do in this situation? You know, this is a lot of, the, a lot of cor corporates say, we're gonna be climate neutral within 25. And then they come with these car carbon offsets, you know, and, they, and one of the justifications to do that is the South. They say, we invest where we can, you know, with our offset money, we invest somewhere probably in the yeah. south, and there we can make even more for the climate than here. Turns out, after like a certain experience that these carbon offsets are most of the time just an excuse to keep on um, with, the, with the emissions in our own country, not to do enough. And that's why the Basel government has decided, no, our way is not the carbon offsets. We do it like we did with the wastewater. We wanna show that it is possible. We wanna go ahead. That was our commitment, and the Basel government therefore decided to um, say that we want to be carbon neutral by 2040, but really, of course, here in Basel, we cannot change like 
all the imports and everything, that's not possible. But here, here on our canton, we want to achieve it. And therefore, um, we really took serious measures. The electricity problem we solved about 10 years ago. Basel, 100% renewable electricity for 10 years, including the storage. Because our utility, the Industrielle Werke Basel, was mandated by the government and the people to only invest in re renewable energies. And that for 30 years now. So when you consume electricity here, it is not fossil, it is not nuclear. This gives us the possibility to also attack the other things. It's the, the industry and the houses, the warming systems. And there, the, the Basel Parliament decided with a law that now it's not allowed anymore to replace a fossil heat heating with another fossil heating. It's not allowed. And it's the same system with the water treatment. We said, we end this. There's a deadline. But we help you to achieve it. And we are building now a renewable carbon-free warming um, network. We spent about half a billion to make sure that everybody has the option to heat his house or to run his company in the future fossil free. And then we decided to have uh, our public transport 100% um, renewable by 27. The heating will be um, renewable by 37. And uh, so that we can say, we can say without shame that it's doable here in Basel to be no emission free, emission free by 2040 without offset payments or anything. And I think there is still a lot of work to do, but I think this is the way to do it, and it's the best me message that we can send out. Basel is a wealthy city. Basel has the possibility to do it. Basel has the maturities to do it. So let's go on. Let's show that it's possible. That is what we have to do and dedicate our work for. And in, in that sense, I thank you very much for your work and I wish you a lot of success for your um, Congress here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Beat Jans. You can have here a seat together with uh, Remco and Astrid. And we will uh, start with a debate on what we have as well heard in this first, uh, in this first session. Just have a seat. You have to share a li little bit the mic. And we take you, Astrid, here. In the and I give you the mic for the moment that I don't have <coughs> to hold it. And... Uh, Maybe I want to start uh, with uh, Astrid and, and Remco. Remco as well, Beat, you couldn't hear it, and, but unfortunately, but um, Remco as well explored what is the responsibility, responsibility of the healthcare system, of health, how we understand medicine. And uh, he really uh, emphasized uh, we are as well in the medical sector in a, in a logic of growth. And we have to rethink if this is the approach that we really need 
in the whole economic si system coming to a degrowth system. This came was a little bit disputed here as well in the room. Then afterwards, yes, degrowth, but for whom? Huh? The, because there is a lot of inequities in the world. And Astrid with, uh, with, uh, from the Swiss DPH with Gulara, together with Gulara, uh, they really um, um, showed as well in this concrete example how important it is uh, to invest in the health sector, especially in the primary health sector. And I think there is a link again between you both, uh, um, um, a sort of a common ground. You, you told us, uh, Remco, make the things easier, make health systems easier and come back to the basis we have, as well as Medicus Mundi uh, 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 emphasized the important role of primary health care. So the, the, the response to that is that there's a lot of talk also, both uh, here in Europe and outside about emission-free healthcare going uh, net zero and how to, be how to reduce also the, the emissions in the healthcare sector, because they're quite large. I think they, they five to eight percent of emissions in a city or in a country are linked to, to healthcare, medicines, production, etc. Now where I, um, so now there's a lot of talk about sustainability and transformation to make that possible, um, but we s assume that healthcare can still go on as we did it before. And I think this is where my interaction is. We need to rethink how we what the role is of medicine and, and how we see health in a, in a society, including the role of health promotion, uh, et cetera. And that leads us to think about limits to medicine. What can we expect from medicine and what not? What, can, what should we formalize and what not? And we have become quite dependent also then on all these um, uh, uh, medical products that have been generated and they're not equally shared. And this is where we can simplify. But it is a question of justice, and it is a question of shared responsibility. So it, d it would also mean that we need to invest in primary health care and in the basics, including in, uh, uh, in places like uh, at the RLC where you mentioned. So, so I think this is where, where the link is. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the bottom line is, if we want to do that, then we need to... Uh, we need to, to, to limit ourselves here in Western Europe. And that's the, chi that's the fairness and justice part which is so difficult. Astrid, do you want to react to this? This degrowth mod model as well and in the context of, of, of health systems? Yeah. Well, I'm only just, I'm also reading the, book, the book now, uh, Less is More. So I'm just getting into the topic. But um, I guess it depends a bit on the on the perspective, um, what he's, he's more of a luxury medicine, we're doing too much here in this context, and then when we go to other places, uh, we don't even um, achieve the minimum standards. I've been, the last four years, I've been in Madagascar, and uh, when, I, when I come to Uzbekistan, for example, I see, ah, it's much better, but actually we shouldn't uh, compare Uzbekistan with Madagascar, but we should probably compare Uzbekistan with, with a place like here because that's the that's the a bit the standard. But yes, it, it could be too much and our luxury medicine is maybe a bit over the top. Ulara, from your perspective. Do you want to react on this? Probably you have to unmute. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I fully agree with Astrid. Yes, the luxury medicine became in our life, it's uh, very important. And uh, I also, as a, a general specialist and uh, as a doctor and as a public health specialist, is uh, I, I, I see that the um, uh, people are uh, beco uh, beco um, tr tr trying to use more, more and more uh, medicines and uh, they forget about the healthy lifestyle, healthy nutrition and... Uh, Yes, this is the reason why, and also promotion of the medicines is increasing. Last time we are always seeing on the TV, on the radio, everywhere the um, uh, promotion of the latest medicines, which is all, all, all also reflect to the population. They try to they they are be, they believe so this. Uh, 
promotion uh, billboards and they they are trying to use more and more medicines yes thank you very much it was very um, informative and uh, excellent presentation and uh, yeah thank you uh, I want to be a little bit nasty, but uh, <laughs> uh, it's really uh, um, impressive uh, the steps Basel Stadt has done. And as a citizen of this canton, I'm as well a little bit proud of it. But we could as well say, of course, and we have the means for it. We have uh, we have uh, a strong economic base here in Basel, the financial resources. Thanks as, as well of because of the medicine and medical industries, especially pharmaceutical industries here in town. Uh, what Remkoy would tell you, yes, okay, well it's nice, but the first thing you or what you have to do besides these technical solutions, you have to go to another model to degrowth. And I suppose. Uh, uh, our main taxpayers in, in Baselstadt wouldn't like it so much. So how do you deal with these uh, questions around uh, around uh, climate just justice? It's a well, first of all, uh, that's my daily business nasty question, so I, I, uh, I like it. Um, but in general, I have to say, I'm I'm not a fan of the degrowth model. I'm a fan of the donut, e donut economy that was developed by, I think her name is Rita Raworth. It's absolutely worth reading. She says, and that's, that's absolutely my opinion, there, there if you, depends on which economy you look like, but there is always, um, how do you say, um, sectors where you need development. They, we need more, we need better. And there are others where we can say, this is like in terms of resources that are destroyed, consumed. It, we have a waste of, of lots of things. I mean, when you see the, the trash that we burn every, it's incredible, you know, it is absolutely clear. There's all we have to develop strategy to, in certain sectors, to come down with the luxury, with the overconsumption. And now the question, is that health? I'm, I, I don't feel dedicated to answer that. And I don't, I'm not also, um, I f I'm not the, 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 the lawyer of the, the corporates here in Basel, I'm not. But of course we have an intensive discussions with them about these issues. And here in Basel, Novartis and Roche are the drivers of the climate protection. I'm not kidding. Novartis, I don't know how they will realize it. They said by 2025 here in Basel, they want to be carbon neutral. And they push us to help them, you know, with infrastructure and everything. I mean, this is an incredible goal, 2025. And they want to be worldwide carbon neutral by 2030, including all three scopes. That means everybody who delivers to them a anything has to be carbon neutral as well. This is an incredible goal. So, and they realize from their investors, uh, they ask it. I mean, BlackRock, the biggest investing company of the world, they send out letters saying, if you don't do that, if you don't save our planet where our business is working, we might, we might, um, have personal consequences in your leadership. That's what they threatened them. So it's the corporate world, at least when it comes to car the, the, the whole climate issue, has made a mind change. I cannot tell you how credible they really realize mm. it, put it down, and, and, and that's another question. I, I, as I said, I'm not their lawyer. So, and, and then there's the other question, the, with the global justice world the, the in the south of course they need our support um, and it's not done for Basel by just saying we have made our part and that's not enough I mean I followed these all these climate conferences for decades and it was always a very very big big question how can we help the south to do the right steps 
and I think is absolutely a financial question. It's absolutely clear that we, and plus of doing the right thing here, we have to support them doing the right thing. But therefore, we also need technology. We need the knowledge, and that's going to be developed the fastest when we do what we promise. That's uh, my answer. Remco, you want to react? Thank you very much. And I will, in this, uh, go to, to Amelie and ask if there is something in the chat Bec and open it up to everyone. Because this is, a, this is, I think, a crucial debate in politics at the moment that you're uh, hitting on. So it's the, 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 the well-being so model from Kate Rayward with the donut economics, where it's about realizing the, the, the minimal services, education, healthcare, food, while respecting ecological barri uh, barriers. It's how to get there and who is responsible and that uh, companies then become sustainable and go net zero, that's laudable. At the same time, the same capitalist-driven system of property is sustained and the rest of the world becomes dependent of the wastewater techniques that are developed here or the medicines that are developed in the pharmaceutical sector. And this is where coloniality and historical uh, understandings is interesting because what can you then expect? And we have been now busy for, for several decades with sustainable development and public-private partnerships and we see how limited we get, not at the, at the local level, because at the local levels it, uh, it, it might work. In Amsterdam, there's a lot of talking about the, the donut model driving, driving the city becoming greener. But at an aggregate, we see the crisis mainly taking place in the global south at the moment. And the responsibility there and the finance that is needed um, needs to come from somewhere, we and we can't just become then dependent from charitable grants from uh, from pharmaceutical companies, etc. So there, it's really a question about ownership and democratization, and and who uh, is then responsible for how we are going to organize our economies. It's a difficult one, but uh, but a needed one. Thank you very much. Uh, now we open up to the floor here, and uh, there is a first question or statement. Maybe you introduce yes, yourself. Yes, absolutely. So my name is... Uh, Maybe I've switched it off, you know. And now it's coming here. Uh, so my name is Lasha Gugwadze. I represent the International Federation of Red Cross, Red Cross and Societies. Many thanks for... for, for um, interventions. I think it's the, the fabulous panel. So I used to work in cancer Legia, so I, I know the, the reality in RLC like 20 years ago, not before. Um, and thanks for the government for the introduction. I just have the question, um, how, uh, what, what is your feeling? How the uh, people of Basel are taking your initiatives? So uh, do, do, do people understand all the seriousness and um, how basically so what are the reaction of the people and how they participate uh, in, in all this process? Thank you. Um, you can respond afterwards. I will take another question or statement from Beat. Another Beat. <laughs> Hello, Beat. <laughs> Yes, my name is Beat Rinker. I was the former director of a, a left-wing think tank in Switzerland, Denknitz, and I'm the author of a book which is called Pharma for the People. You can find the flyer outside on a table. I have uh, two remarks and a question. First remark, a year ago, Roche and Novartis bought back their shares in the amount of 34 billion of dollars. And they destroyed the shares afterwards, so it was a gift to the shareholders. 34 billion of resources which could have been used for a very important things, you know, developing medicines f for uh, the global south, things like that. I mean, a lot of different things can be done with 34 billions, mm -hmm. but they didn't. And they are so much oriented to financial markets as all the other big companies so all these ideas of changing the world without changing that dynamics won't work. And you can see it, Novartis now wants to get rid of Sado, which is the 
part of generic uh, medicine, because it's not profitable enough, it's 10% to profits you can uh, generate with generics, but that's not enough, they want to have 40%. That's their own goal setting. So I believe that we have to really change, we have to change the question of power, who controls the, the, the production and the distribution and the development of pharmaceuticals, in what interests. And that my suggestion and proposal is that we have to tell Novartis, let's give, you shall give the Sado part of your company to the public. Give it to us. We will develop an alternative way of, uh, of doing pharmaceuticals much closer to the needs of the people, much closer link to basic medicines, not in opposed to, but in a, in a, in a big link. Link to all the initiatives we know, like GARDEP, the NDA, and so on. And that will, go, will help us to really change the development. How the government of Basel could support this idea? And would you be prepared to do that? Beat, uh, Beat asks Beat nasty question, and Beat likes this. <laughs> Maybe could you can react to uh, to those questions. So, how is the public reacting on the measures? But as well, uh, and we know you are not the lawyer of this uh, um, um, corporates. But how the question was, uh, how could be, uh, there be a way to move in this direction? I think it's as well a little bit the general questions how we can bring as well ethics to governments and ethics to corporates. Well, first maybe also that question there. Um, there's going to be a vote in Basel. That's how all the uh, politics get developed. So people will decide between uh, 2050 20 or 2037. So a referendum has been taken, and this is going to decide how we how we proceed. Then, um, so I am very optimistic that they will choose <coughs> 37, eventually even <coughs> 30, because an initiative wants it 30, because uh, in the parliament it was it was strongly backed. 37 had a had a big majority. Then, and that's how also we include the people, right? Um, we will develop, when we have this th the task 37, we will have to develop several tools to include the people and the companies, because at the end of the day, we have to achieve it, and everybody has to help. And then the, c the, the question of, of the medicines, uh, the corporates, that's a very difficult question. Um, yes, yesterday I met um, one of the leaders of the big corporates. He was not so happy. He just, his latest study showed that one of his cancer, new cancer treatments fail. The company is losing millions and millions. <coughs> so the share went down. And it's not a good year, he said. Um, it just shows how much risk these companies are taking. And I have not decided yet for myself if we as a democracy would be able to do that as well. I, I see now, I'm not so long in the government, democracy and governments are very, very slow and they don't like risks. You know, I mean, imagine you have a loss of a billion somewhere in your balance. You don't want to do that as a member of the government. And is it, is it right to take risks in the medicine? I don't know. I just, I just hear them that they say, like also with the patent question, when they say, if you take away these patents, we're not gonna do it. Other people will have to do it then to take the risk. It's, it's mandatory. 
we can, we, where should we find the money to invest so much in research? They're talking about billions. In Basel, every year, several billions of Swiss francs are invested in medical research. Where should that money come from if it's not the private investors? Is, is democracy, is the people ready for that? I don't know. I have no clear answer. I, I don't, I just, my only message is the answer is not easy. And the same thing with Sondo probably. There the risks are uh, definitely lower. It's generics and, and, but there I think the problem is also less big. I think with the generics because, um, um, yeah, they, they, that's how I think it is. But you, you know it much better than I do. And I, they are, you, you read a lot and, 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 and publish a lot about this. But I think the generics follow much more like really the demand and, uh, but, Sondo Thanks. maybe, but I, I, I can tell you there's no, there's far, there's no way there's a majority in, 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 the, in the population here in Basel for such a move. That Thank we take over part of, a, of, of a such a, an industry. Thank you, Beat. I would like to uh, go to Amelie, uh, who is responsible for our online uh, participants. And you've got questions or statements. I have a question from Monica Christofori Katka. Um, they say, I fully understand the results of the SCPH assessment. However, it is the classic approach to tackle health gaps. What additional, um, what additional will SCPH do in Uzbekistan to really address the ecological and climate related causes? So this is a question for Astrid or Gulara. Did you get the question? And this question comes from Monica, and she's excused, excused by this way that she cannot be here today, but she participates actively uh, online. Monica is uh, from the Swiss Red Cross and a member of, of the Medicus Mundi Switzerland board. Yes, but I'm, I'm going to turf the question either to Kulara or to Helen, who is also here, who were more in the lead of the assessment, if that's allowed. Certainly, certainly. To whom shall I give the to Helen. Thank you. Th thanks very much for the question, also the presentation. I mean, I, I maybe just to respond at the end of the presentation, it said there's a lot of international investment being made into the ROC region. Um, and our involvement was really to guide where the German investment, the German investment bank, AFW, would put its investments into the health sector. This needs to be seen, though, in the context of the, the huge emergency that the ROC is. There are similar, much, much bigger investments being made at the moment in the water sector, in the agricultural sector. Uh, so this is kind of screaming uh, from all sides, I think, the whole region. And of course, then we were coming at it from the point of view of basic service provision, uh, health sector investments, there's also education sector investments being made. Um, so I think that was a bit our lens to bring this to attention. It illustrates the, the dramatic uh, kind of interplay of all of these factors together. Um, and I guess, yeah, just as a reaction, the, the responses that are being made are still, in my view, too sectoral in that sense. But, but this is the way the world is set up. So it's not easy to say, let's have a combined, integrated approach that's really going across all the different sectors, all the different aspects of the crisis. So, yeah, I think we had a specific mandate just to respond to the question. But, of course, the challenge is a much bigger one, and it would take many actors to, to respond. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, there are still two questions or statements from the floor. Ilse, I come to you. Maybe you present yourself. Thank you, Ilse van Roen, Solidarmet. And maybe full disclosure offhand, uh, before I joined Solidarmet, my career was in the pharma industry. So I just wanted to say we have to be a little bit careful with the simplistic sort of blaming the pharma industry for all the bad things in the world. Um, they have also brought a lot of good. Indeed, the pharma industry does not always have very um, ethical practices, maybe, but I do think it's a balanced view that is needed, and it's a complex um, situation that needs to be resolved. 
also wanted to point out just a, a specific example. I heard the comment from Remco against, yeah, vaccines, maybe not too many vaccines. Let's not forget, for example, the HPV vaccine, which prevents women to get cervical cancer. If women, if girls in Africa don't get access to HPV vaccine, they will develop a disproportionate number of cervical cancer. Cervical cancer in those countries cannot easily be treated. Cervical cancer vaccine is available in Africa because it's sold at a high price in other places of the world. Just saying, throw away the patents, let's make it all generic. I'm sorry, that's not such an easy solution. So let's just be careful. I agree with Be Beat. It's a complex situation and there are no easy, straightforward, just blame the industry type of solution. Thank you, Ilse. Wim. Thank you very much. My name is Willem van der Put from uh, ITM in Antwerp. And I thank you all three for uh, beautiful presentations. Uh, what should be done, what is actually not done, and what can be done. I think that, that, that is a nice bridge there. And uh, let's not be nasty for a change, but Mr. Jans, uh, let's uh, take you as an enlightened politician. And in the end, you will, you are in charge. Eh? We, if, we, if we don't want to throw out democracy, it will be people like you who do it. So my question to you is, what do you need from us from scientists, from NGOs, from others, how can we help you achieve results, perhaps not only in Basel, but on a, <laughs> on a larger scale? D do you need evidence or anything? What, what, what could we do to help? Very good. For this will be the, the, uh, the final round we do with you there. So uh, just maybe, Beat, you start with your answer, uh, with answering this, what can we do? for enlightened politicians who like nasty questions like <laughs> that. <laughs> no, thank you for that question. And it's a very difficult one because myself, I'm an environmental scientist. I always listen to science. I'm interested in science and they guide me. But the question is how do you, or do you reach the others that go whatever, what, what I mean, and, and particularly in a world with social media growing and whatever spread there, there's so many nonsense around. And, but I think, sorry to say, that's the only thing is just keep, stay patient, go out, talk with everybody. I had a very nice experience with Marcel Tanner. You may know him, he is one of the chief epidemiologists worldwide, he travels everywhere, he consults countries. He, uh, I have seen him in Tanzania, how he, he changed the, the health system together with the government in, in, in order to really, really save millions of people it just Sorry, in changing the you. focus and doing the right thing. He's great, he's fantastic, he knows ep epidemics all over the world. And I was engaged with him on a, pa on a panel with people that are like against scientists. With the va they were against vaccines, they were against masks, you know, and they pretty much denied the pandemic. And he was there. I was upset, I have to say. I, I, can't, I can't stay calm in this situation, but he was so calm. He answered every single question, calmly, scientifically, in words that everybody understood. And this crowd, there were about 500 people, they got calmer and calmer and calm. When I said something, they shouted, and <laughs> he answered, they, it, it like, I think that's what we have to do. And don't be afraid of talking to these people that have other opinions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Remco, what would you now, and all of you, as well, then Gulara on the street, now we have the, the COP27 uh, uh, climate summit before us, what would you, if, if you are now the one who can open up uh, this speech, you don't have to do this speech, but what would you be your message to the, uh, to the, to the politicians in uh, Egypt. We in the end talk about politics and political vision about how we organize our societies, including 
in medicine and, uh, and public health. Uh, the it, it's about legitimacy of ownership and innovation in, in society and who decides on what kind of economies we would like to organize that benefits human uh, prosperity. Um, and then you can raise questions about who owns that innovation and that, that capital wealth to actually do that. And what's, <coughs> what's res how responsibility is organized, uh, is organized there. And we do as if we, and I'm very critical here also about the, the medical sector, and I feel that I'm allowed to do that having a medical background. It's not so much about being against or for uh, medicine, but really looking at which basic medicines are needed to generate value that uh, are linked to human needs. It's very contextually different, but a lot of what we produce now is basically uh, what they call uneconomic. It just generates value and profit at the end of life. Uh, a lot of profit is made by the pharmaceutical companies in relation to cancer, but the added value from a public health perspective is limited. Now, if, if we would uh, organize things much more locally, including in via, via having uh, intellectual property being, ensuring that uh, generic medicine is made locally, that's also much less carbon um, intensive uh, than producing uh, uh, stuff and medicine all across the world. That would be, that, that's just one example to go. In the end, I hear a lot I, in these talks about evidence, etc., and who generates evidence. I hear a lot about complexity. We need to be, we need to be careful um, before we change things, but we don't have the time anymore. We had that time 20 years ago to do that, but not anymore. And that's why I am quite outspoken here that it's about a systematic change that is required because we don't want to be in the same situation in, in 20 years because then decent feeling crisis are really literally ensuring that there will be more uh, floodings, droughts, etc. And if you really want to see the, the, the speech last year from uh, Maya Motley from the Barbados at COP26, that's the main speech to look if you would like to ask what people should do for COP27. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can hand over to Astrid. Thanks. Um, I'm coming a bit back to our assessment, which was more about an investment. And I think if we um, do those investments in certain places, we have to be a bit careful what we link them to, and what demands that we have that are linked to those investments because um, these are often in countries where the carbon emissions are very, very low so far. At the same time, they're experiencing the, you know, the highest um, tolls up to this moment. So for people in those places, what they want at this stage is really growth, <laughs> economic growth, and that they are actually better. So who are we to tell them what they invest their money in or how, you know, the money should be spent. So I don't have an answer either to this, but we have to be a bit careful not to maybe dictate again what they're supposed to do. Thank, thank you very much. Gulara, your message to world leaders. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, if to come back to the ROC region, the, this region was defined by UN uh, as a, a biggest ecological uh, uh, catastrophe of our time. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, ecological degradation in ROC region reflected not only in Uzbekistan, but is to also to the um, neighboring countries, uh, uh, Tajikistan, um, Kazakhstan, uh, Turkmenistan, Afghanistan. Where you, oh, uh, I spent uh, about five years in Tajikistan, and I, uh, I, I, uh, there is uh, the uh, dust storms become uh, became in Tajikistan more often, often, uh, often and often. So um, the population um, uh, suffering from the social and economical problems due to the 
lost uh, due to the uh, all this uh, economical situation re related to this um, ecological catastrophe. So uh, the main problem that uh, very often uh, the politicians are not understand the scientific people, public health specialists, uh, me, uh, uh, and uh, it is sometimes it is difficult to 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 explain and to uh to, to to explain to politician politicians all serious of this situation so uh maybe even in uzbekistan uh, we uh, very often uh, faced some problem when we uh um, defending our uh, proposals and uh, activities so uh, i will be very happy in if politician can understand this um uh this uh this all uh, serious seriously uh seri of dangerous of this situation and um, uh to trust to the uh, scientific people and support uh, the scientific uh, uh community in uh, their proposals uh for for improvement and for reforms in such regions as uh, uzbekistan Thank you so much. Thank you, Gulara. Thank you, all the speakers and panelists uh, for this debate. We go now to a break, coffee break, and we will back, be back in, let's say, a quarter to 12. Uh, I would, uh, and afterwards, I hand over to, to, to Sarah Traore, who will uh, then uh, coordinate or moderate the next block of session. So thank you very much. Enjoy the coffee exchange. Uh, keep in contact and uh, see you back here.
Are we ready? Can we quickly mm. test the mic? So, welcome back, everyone. Welcome after this short break um, for our next session and the last session before lunch. Um, my name is Sarah Traoré. I'm with the Swiss Malaria Group, which is a proud member and partner of um, Medicus Mundi Schweiz. Um, I will lead you to the next session, and let's dive right into it with the NGOs, uh, with the NGOs that are not only, not only the ones asking for accountability and um, in dealing with the crisis um, with climate change. They are also the ones that, are res that have responsibilities and they have their own duties. This is one of the, the points that will be addressed um, in the next se session with um, an academic voice and also two perspectives of NGOs from the Global North and the Global South as well. So the title of our next presentation is NGOs Ready to Change Perspective. <coughs> In this presentation, Dr. Blaise Janson um, will, will ask if civil society organizations are ready actually to change their perspectives facing the damage and the dangers of climate change. Dr. Blaise Janton, Blaise is a tropical medicine physician and professor at the University of Lausanne as well. He is part um, of the collective Doctors for Extinction Rebellion. I welcome you to the stage. Blaise, the floor is yours. There we go. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation and the introduction. I would say I'm not a specialist of NGOs. Uh, I have worked uh, three years for ICRC, but it was about uh, 30 years ago when Museveni came into power in Uganda. That uh, brings you a bit the, the situation. And, uh, but I have lived for 12 years in uh, tropical countries, uh, eight years in Papua New Guinea, and uh, already also in uh, Tanzania some years. I don't want to be prescriptive. I just uh, give you some uh, opinion. So the content, uh, I'm sorry, a bit, I'm a bit formal, but because people are so worried about minutes, I'll, I'll just uh, tell you about. So some lessons from the COVID pandemic. I have been heavily involved in the vaccination campaign. So I'm vaccinologist, don't, don't fear. Uh, why to change NGO perspective? How to change uh, their perspective? from theory to practice, because we are talking a lot, but uh, it's not always easy to implement, and some uh, ethical dilemma. So you all know about uh, the virus of inequalities. I mean, the rich countries have uh, sequestered all uh, control measures, uh, being especially first masks, but also afterwards uh, vaccine and uh, drugs. So. This is, I think, the, the, the dramatic illustration of what happens. Is really, it's, this is the, the number of, uh, the, uh, I can show you here. Yeah, this is the number of doses per 100 people, two, more than 200 in high-income countries and uh, uh, less than uh, 50 in low-income countries. 23% of the population in low-income countries have been vaccinated versus uh, 68 in um, uh, high-income countries. So why is it like that? We discussed a lot. I hope the president has left. Uh, uh, this is the sale revenue of Pfizer, the projected for 2022 for drugs vaccine. So this is basically the reason of the failure of COVAX initiative or what any other initiative to have enough vaccines in, in poor countries. It's basically that the rich countries paid more. It's a bit simplistic, but I think it's really what happened. So what happened? What we do now? First vaccination, second vaccination, first booster, second booster, repeated uh, uh, vaccines that are less and less useful, except in highly vulnerable populations. So I think this is the, the, the only reason, and WHO has clearly stated that repeated vaccination is not a vaccination strategy. So I just go a bit in one slide because I think 
we have to know, did it matter that Africa didn't have vaccines, for example? And I think this is quite important. So if you look at, at that here, this is the number of cases. So it is in, in uh, we don't see very well, in blue is Switzerland, green Senegal, and violet South Africa. The top one is Switzerland because we have more diagnostic. Roche was there. He, uh, that was relatively clear. This is first wave, second wave, or whatever wave. This is the Omicron wave. And here is the death. So what you see here is Switzerland. So the death, you know, a lot of death in uh, 2020. Uh, and then vaccination started and very few deaths. South Africa here, a bit of delay a lot of death, and death continue because they didn't have the vaccine and they have a lot of comorbidities. So South Africa really uh, suffered. But you see Senegal, very few cases. This is just not the case. Serological survey now show that between 70 and 90% of the African population has been infected, and, uh, but they didn't get the vaccine, but they have few deaths and deaths are easier to identify. And uh, just because uh, there are many reasons, but one of the main reasons is that the median age in sub-Saharan Africa is 19 years versus a, a, a lot more. And so they have much less vulnerable population. So this was actually not so bad. And for example, in Senegal, they said, oh, we vaccinated our older people and people don't want other vaccines actually uh, to be uh, uh, people to be immunized. So. The other one is Tanzania. Tanzania, completely flat. This is Switzerland, flat. Flat here. Nothing happened in Tanzania. No. The strategy in Tanzania and Burundi was the denial. First of all, we all said, oh, they are crazy, they are foolish, uh, they, they have also COVID vaccine. But actually, this strategy probably saved a lot of lives because they didn't do a lockdown. They continued to go to the market. They continued to grow their veggies, they have transport for drugs and, and uh, uh, whatever control measures. And this actually probably was a very good strategy, not replicating the strategy in the rich countries that may not be the best for them. They knew their context. Here, just, and this is the last slide on COVID, is forget about the light blue, just look at the dark blue, this is the proportion of bed nets that were planned to be distributed, that were actually distributed. And you see these are the different countries. And what you see in Tanzania, 95% of the planned bed nets have been distributed. So the control measures continued to be implemented. So basically the, the lesson learned, there are a lot on COVID, a lot, a lot. But just the two that I wanted to stress today is that the really one size doesn't fit all. We cannot come with our own strategy thinking that's what you should do. This is obvious, but we still do it. You know? And um, so it's also listen to the local actors because they know their own context. So you have all seen the Lancet countdown of last published last week. Basically, you have seen that all indicators are getting worse, except one that is the number of articles on the impact of uh, climate change on health. And this is the only thing that uh, improved. The worst is that basically fossil fuels continue to be extracted, exploited, because there are a lot of people that actually gain a lot of money of that. So why should NGO change perspective? I'm sorry, again, the president is not here, but it's really the failure of the government and our states to really act effectively for social and climatic justice. So, frankly, countries, politicians are ignoring the gap between the rich and the poor, especially between countries, but also within countries. That was said this morning. Maximizing their individual interest and profit, uh, and not public health need and benefit. And really, it's also, the countries continue to put pressure for death repayment rather than death relief. We hope that something will be 
This will be addressed during the COP27. So what happens is really that this is a food crisis. It's a horrible illustration, but it's so true. I'm sorry, you, you don't care. Uh, in three days, you are dead. That's what the situation that is <laughs> presently uh, uh, the case. So we fail of just social justice. We fail also about climatic justice. There is inaction, or so little action. We see, he said, in 15 years, we will have transport that are fossil fuels uh, uh, free or something like that. This is too late. This is an urgency. I know you are all convinced, so you know. So there is really no willingness to make decision or establish regulation. We see this in Switzerland. It's a dramatic. We keep on deciding and we keep on having referendum, etc. This is called direct democracy. I don't call this like that. And... Uh, there is also definitely no financial contribution uh, for mitigation and adaptation in affected countries. And that's also one of the subjects of, uh, of the COP27. So how can we change this perspective? We have to circumvent the government in action. So basically, if we don't believe too much in the government, they should be there. We, we agree. But they should be other ways. And you are all <laughs> part of, of, of this uh, initiatives, and I think we really need to have this bottom-up initiative coming from the individual, coming from the citizens, coming from the, 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 the communities, the association or whatever. We really need to, to have that because we have to work on alternative societal model. Maybe for those in, in France and, and Switzerland and Germany, they know about the ZAD. ZAD is the extreme, but if they really want to... ZAD is a zone à défendre, uh, areas to defend. And, and, and they propose really another, an alternative model of society. This is not the, 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 the example, but it's a kind of examples of especially young people try to live uh, uh, differently. So we should promote autonomy, rather than dependence. You say, this is obvious, but we still make them dependent. And um, so if, you, if we want to do actions, local actions uh, in Africa or elsewhere, we really need to assess the environmental risk there before implementing something so that we can foster mitigation and adaptation strategies. I must say we have and th this is not for all organizations, but we really need to shift from disaster relief to development actions, because the disaster is there. It's there in a lot of places. So we need to have actions that have a positive impact on the environment and the climate. And we have to implement action that comply to planetary limit. We heard that with Remco. So how can we change in terms of health? for the, the, the health agencies, for example. We have to give priority to prevention and health promotion. All obvious, but it's not done. And we, we have to promote, we talked about that, a more sober, more human, more equitable medicine, reduce the sophisticated equipment that actually don't help much. Mortality is not because you do five times uh, uh, imaging and things like that. that. This is not related directly. You have to develop environmentally friendly medical practices and health infrastructure. That is a lot of carbon emission. We have to engage the population and patient. We should know what they want for their health and not what the politicians or what the, the, the doctors or what the health professional want. They, they should uh, di discuss. And we should communicate about situation and requested action. This is just an action that we did uh, somewhere here. It was a letter that we brought to Ted Ross uh, during the World Health Assembly in 2021. Yes, 2021. Uh, we did a demonstration that was a letter signed by 1,200 health professionals in the world. And Ted Ross came out of the assembly hearing about our <laughs> uh, meeting. And then it was very impressive because he turned to the WHO building and said, this is your home, to Doctor for Extension Rebellion. And then, I am one of yours, 
and he took the pin. Really, that was absolutely fabulous. Nothing in the Swiss media, a lot in Indonesia, uh, other places, but uh, that's what, how it... And we asked him to read our demands, to three minutes, yeah, uh, to, the, um, to the country representative, and he did, uh, you can see this on the, on the Twitter. So, nothing new, I know that all of you, or most of you, have been involved in these uh, different uh, actions, uh, and especially the Climate Action Accelerator, because that this is what actually builds communities around this environmental strategy. So really, from theory to practice, we, we need as agency to me measure, to set targets, to minimize carbon and waste food, uh, footprint. It's easy, but not so much. We have to reduce expatriate staff, reduce travel, uh, include the local actors that they are involved in the decision processes, and then they can uh, take all the responsibility, use short circuit, use low-cost, simple technology, support local manufacture of health products. We saw that with vaccine. It worked in India. It worked in, uh, in uh, South Africa for COVID vaccines. Encourage also the local supplier, supplier to decarbonize uh, their production and to support adaptation mechanism. Now, the last bit is about some ethical dilemma. Should we respond to acute emergencies or should we go for mitigation adaptation? Maybe it's a bit disruptive, but is it really wise to provide food supplies for years in areas where they, there are and they will be anyway unlivable? I mean, you know, bringing food, bringing food, bringing food. I think this, we have to think differently. Is it wise, for example, to promote digital health? in an area of limited energy and raw material. We have really to do the balance between the short-term benefits in health and potentially the long-term uh, environmental impact. I just show you one example. We are involved, we do these studies. For the last 15 years, we have tried to reduce the antibiotic consumption while still improving uh, health of children with fever. So we, we did clinical decision charts, uh, quite a number of involved, uh, SDC also, in, in different countries. And uh, uh, so we, we really implemented that with a very good result, basically improvement of health outcome, but also a, a, a monster reduction uh, in the control health facilities. 95% of the kids were going out with antibiotics. In the last version of our clinical algorithm, 11%. So basically, it's a lot of millions of antibiotics that has been spared, and you know that drugs are uh, the reasons for a lot of carbon emissions. So is it good when we think, is it ecologically sustainable? And this is the question that we are asking now with our project and with all the other projects. Uh, of, for example, tablet implementation. You, you know about fair phones. Should we have fair tablets, that would be much better because they come very quickly obsolete. But you see also the, the raw material here, you know, 10 to 15 years of some of these materials that are uh, necessary for uh, having this digital health. So really the question is not, not doing digital health, but who should benefit from the digital health in priority? And we should think of that for all our actions. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Blaise. Thank you for this very um, inspiring presentation, very dense. Um, working myself for quite some years in renewables, I really like your energy and enthusiasm. I hope it's contagious. I quickly want to see if there is any um, immediate response or, or um, input to Blaise's presentation. If not, we're going to take questions afterwards. Thank you, Blaise. So after um, Blaise's perspective um, of a changing role of those NGOs, we are going to hear Hafid Derbal, who will explore how Terre des Hommes, Schweiz, is um, managing the changing environment. Um, with a specific example um, of their own strategy to reduce their organization's CO2 um, emissions. 
So Hafid, I'm quickly going to introduce you. Um, Hafid is desk of um, sexual and reproductive health and rights at Terre des Hommes here in Basel, as well as program coordinator for Zimbabwe and South Africa. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sarah, and uh, merci, Blaise. It was very inspiring, and, and you will see a lot of things connect, of course. Um, I also have a, quite a background in, in youth work, which um, is very key to the work of Terre des Hommes because youth are the primary community we work with for almost 20 years. Um, so you heard a bit of my background, and um, so as a, as a um, desk for sexual reproductive health and rights, I, I have the chance to interact with many um, program countries, Central um, America to Southern Africa. And um, we work there also to understand how we work with local partners and uh, local staff in offices supporting the work of um, CBOs in the, the different countries. Um, usually when, you, when we meet in this network, I speak about SRHR, I speak about youth, uh, friendly interventions, etc. And this is my comfort zone. What I'm going to share today is is a bit different. It's it's really more a journey as an actor in this field and act as actors in this field. Thoughts, um, fears, insecurities, convictions, visions, all of that that comes into dynamic when we meet in these spaces, but also when we we work within our organizations. And I think this is where I'm going now, um, and I hope we can we can build on some of the inputs. So um, I'm I'm still quite young, but I'm I'm also I've been th there is a younger generation coming up, um, and for as long as I'm politically active and I started engaging in in political questions, climate change was always there, was always an issue. It's nothing new, and we all know it. And when I see news today um, about climate change, whether it's pictures of the Arctic, again, alarming numbers here, and, and I consume news quite regularly, um, at times I, I felt frustrated, sad, guilty, because I also used to fly um, into my holidays. Um, Fatigued, overwhelmed, powerless. Um, René, at the beginning, you said cynic. Um, and these are, I'm sure, feelings you all can relate to when you see um, today news about climate change. And the worst of all these feelings is becoming numb. And all of these feelings are not ideal to take action. They're not motivating you to take action. Actually, they're pushing you into a fatalistic state of mind. Um, but when I remind myself of what pushed me in the first place to be here as working in my position, studying the stuff I study, getting involved in political issues I'm getting involved, it's always turning around um, equalities, inequalities, access, denial of access, and so on. And um, today, what many of us labeled for a long time as social justice or injustice and so on, so things evolve over time. I think today we can um, all, we all know or have an imagination what that might mean, climate justice. And it's close links with gender justice, social justice, intergenerational justice, and so on. All kind, I, I could go on and on. Um, and the the term here that I'm convinced today is not only is going to um, accompany us during this decade, but I, these two words will pretty much define this century. I'm, I'm convinced, at least. That's my perspective. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to bombard you with stats and numbers. We all are clear about the reasons and effects of climate change. That's clear. Although I, I wanted to use this funny... No, it's not, it's not working, but anyway. Just a, a couple of quick facts um, on climate change. Is we are all clear that there is an incredible inequality on 
the emissions that we sent over time over the last centuries of some richer countries emitting a lot over centuries and a very or quite many countries poorer ones have done very little to contribute to this climate crisis um, and yet they're the ones getting in the worst and i think this is where for me, climate change becomes something where I, I feel outraged to, to get to Stéphane Essel, um, indigné, in, so to say, where I feel this is exactly where I, where I see the effects and negative effects, the shocks of the climate changes, is when the most vulnerable uh, communities we work with are getting affected. Um, deliberately shows a picture of um, this year's terrible floods in Pakistan. And the incredible thing is that these century or once in a thousand years floods and heat waves and so on and, um, that used to hit um, seldomly are becoming regular. And the paradox thing is because it becomes regular, you tend to go, ah, again. Um, but when, when you see who's getting hit and when you expose yourself to it, I think this is where we again we get into the practical work of what climate justice is and what we can do about it. Um, I don't want to get paternalistic. Again, I'm not old, but I'm not young anymore. But I, I swear how much I was inspired by the generation and how much hope I got by all the movements that I saw, whether um, on the 14th of June uh, 2019 with a huge feminist movement in, in Switzerland, the Fridays for Future movement, a lot of um, dynamics that came from the new generation. And because we work with youth at Terre des Hommes and we have a specific youth project, um, Imagine, in Basel, but also the youth of being involved and using our facilities, we always get exposed to their ideas, their plans, their discussions, and it's always helping. And over the last years, it became impossible for us to circumnavigate the issue of climate change internally. Um, I, I saw this panel and the dynamic with Blaise and, and uh, Ellen, who's going to present afterwards, that of course we need to address, I mean, it's, it's um, climate crisis has not one single answer because it has not one single cause and needs to be addressed at several levels. And while I absolutely agree that we need to advocate, that's one part, so we, we're part of the Climate Alliance of Alliance Sud, for example, as Terre des as many of you are. Um, and we need to adapt our programming to respond to the um, effects, to the shocks of, climate, of the climate crisis. That's also agreed. And I, I would underline what, whatever Blaise just showed here. I'm, I'm absolutely with you. But my question was, and here I'm speaking as Hafid Derbal, I'm not speaking as Terre des Hommes because what is my contribution as a private person but that an, as, an, as an employee of my organization and as an actor in this network, uh, what can be my contribution? And um, over, the last, um, over the, the last years, we asked ourselves, so how climate just are we as an organization? Can we say something about our emissions? Can we say something on how we want to tackle actually the way we've been emitting and contributing to this crisis, just as any of, of us and any institution was. And my question to all of you is, you work in an institution, most of you, or in a network, etc. do you know how much you emit? Do you know how much you contribute to this crisis? And I'm not pointing fingers, I'm part of this. Um, in order to assess that, Blaise uh, Janton has, has uh, um, mentioned um, the CIA, the Climate Action Accelerator, which is an initiative that helped us, and uh, I know some of you are, are in it, helped us assess our emissions. I don't want to get too technical here, but basically you assess your emissions and then you have a basis to think about how you want to reduce your emissions. And the... Um, the decision we took is to reduce our emissions by 50% until 2030. I'm not saying anything about what I want 
or I would like to happen. I'm just saying as an institution, we decided to reduce our emissions 50% until 2030. And doing, by doing so, I mean, we're a, um, just to have an idea, we are an organization that has eight country programs, we have local staff, and we've been doing our work in a certain way, just as you've been doing your work in a certain way over the last decades. We've been flying for project visits, monitoring visits. We have flights, sometimes for security reasons, over um, distances that we could drive to by car, uh, and so on. There, are, there is a certain structure, and there are many good reasons for that certain structure over the last 10, 20, 30 years. But if you think about development aid in the 60s and 70s, there is a reason we decided to change certain structures, processes, roles. And the basic question and the momentum and the chance and opportunity we have in this climate crisis is to rethink our structures and to ask ourselves, where do we want to be 15 years from now? Where do we want, what do we want to do 15 years from now? Uh, what, um, what is our role? And here, again, I am one employee of a team, of a dynamic, of a global team. There is a fundraising department, there is a communication department, there is a technical advisor in Harare, in Maputo, in Bogota. All of us have to rethink our roles if we are to adapt our structures and the way we have been doing this work over the last 10, 20 years. And also, very important, we need also to assess what we are already doing right. It's not just about, it's a, it's a very, it's a critical reflection. And what I very much like and motivates me, uh, or motivated me over the last two years of this assessment, is the debates that needs to take place systemically in, within your organization. There's a lot of fears in security because you change things. But there are a lot of dynamics that are positive be because you see that you take action, you are active and you think about it, and you create and you contribute to a vision of where you want to be as an actor, but also as a, as a player, as an organization, maybe as a network. And all of these questions are deeply connected to decolonize aid. I'm not, I'm, I, I could speak again 20, 30 minutes on this. If you're not familiar with this report, have a look at it. It's very inspiring. It's like 10 pages summary, 56 pages, 57 pages um, of the whole document. So very readable, doable, and very good, good food for thought. Because it's about also rethinking dynamics, just as Blaise described. It's, um, we've been doing things in a certain way, but sometimes we know that we, are that we shouldn't do it, and still it's being done. Okay, so um, leaving it here. Um, I also want to be honest, I, I have my answers and I have my convictions on many points. But I think, and this you, you um, I, I know you were playing Martin when you said, I have this nasty question, or we have these nasty questions. Actually, it's not a nasty question, it's, really, it's a constructive question. And it's also the way of how do we want to talk to each other and how we want to debate, because uh, we all have our convictions. This is a comfort zone because I, I guess, I assume, we have similar convictions. It gets interesting when you have to oppose them to other roles. Fundraising communication departments, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, when you have to um, balance your programming and what you want to communicate, etc. But it's really about how do you want to have these discussions. Um, and the thing I liked about this process is to have that consultations that team dynamic, etc., over the, uh, like globally, talking to all our colleagues in all programming countries. Because at the end of the day, they, it's about shifting also responsibilities, um, rethinking roles, as I said. Um, and you need to have everyone in the boat. At least over time, you need to get everyone in the boat. And there are no easy answers. I agree with Remco, I agree with Blaise. Actually, we should have done this 20 years ago. But we have a, also a, a duty and a social responsibility 
to find that balance and keep it, and that takes a bit a bit of time. It can't that change can't happen overnight. And how to find that balance between the urgency of taking action action yesterday and still involve everyone? I think I don't have an easy answer. But and this is I'm going to end on this is I I don't know exactly where we're going, but I am very confident we're going in the right way and we're having this the the right discussions and the right asking the right questions. But the answer is not a matter of what I want. The answer can only be developed together. And I I mean it as simply as I say it, but I'm very aware that the way to it is a lot of flexibility openness that we need to challenge ourselves to and um, at the end also perspective and we I can agree I think this is where we can all meet we have the same perspective we have the same wish for the future at the end thank you very much thank you <laughs> thank you so much Hafid any immediate reactions, inputs? Yes, please. I'm going to give you this one. Thank you, John. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Hafid, for speaking to us from the heart. Um, I'm not sure if we need to be convinced that we have to walk this path. Um, because I think most of us are convinced that we have to do that. Um, but I, I just would like to seek some more inspiration. Can you give an example from your organization? Well, what kind of step or what kind of example can you give at an organizational level that you have taken? Because as individuals, we all take our steps, yeah. but how do you do that as an organization? And can you, because in, in your summary or in your abstract, you say we don't, we shouldn't look within the programs. We should look at the organization, how we organize ourselves here in the north. No, no I, I'm not saying we should. Yeah, I, yeah, okay. I know what you what you're referring to. But um, thanks. Just to be, I think, I think the most obvious um, point, and it was clear from the beginning. If we have a look at the emissions, we have a look at the flights. It was so clear because we're not a relief organization. I know that the relief organizations would um, just the intuition was clear, it's, it's going to be on flights. If you reduce your flights and you reduce your monitoring system, um, your visits, etc., you need to rethink your head headquarters structure, which still much of us operate, and so do we. We have our headquarters in, in Basel, and we go down and expand. It gets to absurd situations where I fly down, even if I have a gender studies background, go down to South Africa and tell 55-year-old um, women who fought through um, the apartheid system for women's rights and tell them what gender equality or equity is about. Uh, I mean, th that's of course we are reflecting this, but uh, the most obvious thing is um, the moment you're not on the ground anymore means that the structure needs to shift, and it, this is what I meant with decolonizing aid. It's just one example. Where I want to be um, I, I, I hope I was clear there, but the roadmap is being developed jointly, and we're just in that process. And even we haven't, I think the we ev we haven't even ratified um, this commitment. It's going to happen on the 22nd of November by the board. It's just a formality, but just we're really at the beginning. And the more participatory you do it, and this is what we're trying to do find the balance at the urgency, the more time you also need, loops, etc. And and again, it's happening, and you still have to do your work on the ground, so you can't just think about restructuring, but you also have work to do. So find that balance in the real working life is quite a challenge, but I, I tell you, it's, it's motivating, and, and everyone is on board. Yeah. Thank you. So um, let's have more discussion afterwards and after we hear our next, um, our next presenter. Um, I will happily welcome Alan Shamroff to, the, um, to take my side here for the next presentation. And we will turn our 
perspective to Kolkata, India, where the Medicus Mundi's member organization Calcutta Rescue is working in underserved neighborhoods. Um, Dr. Alan Shamroth is a family doctor in London. He has volunteered in Calcutta. The stage is yours. So I understand, hello everyone, I understand that there are a number of people from Calcutta who are watching online. They don't know me as Alan Shamroth, they know me as Dr. Alan, so to all of them, hello. And I'm very proud to represent this organization, Calcutta Rescue. It does the most remarkable work providing basic primary care to the slum dwellers of Calcutta. I also want to thank MMS for the, the honor and uh, the opportunity to talk to you today about a journey that Calcutta Rescue is embarking on. We've only just started it, admittedly, but we're committed to it and the enthusiasm to continue is there. A journey that's had us focus on how to build resilience into all our organizational activities and how to build climate change resilience into the communities we, we serve. So it's a story that I want to tell in three chapters. Chapter one is about how Calcutta Rescue came to realize that the devastating uh, weather events um, due to climate change. Chapter two is how we realized that it's important to mitigate and adapt to this inevitable worsening of, of, of uh, uh, climate ch uh, co health consequences of climate change. And the third chapter is the nuts and bolts, the manual, how we went about doing it. So let's start off with the first chapter. This is a story of Mrs. Sada. Mrs. Sada lived in the Sundarbans, which is about 100 kilometers south of Calcutta on the Bay of Bengal. And in May 2009, there was a terrible cyclone, Cyclone Ayla, which destroyed over a million Indian and Bangladeshi homes, including Mrs. Sada's. So she fled with her young family to the slums of eastern um, Calcutta. Now we have to fast forward to May of 2020. Another devastating cyclone, Cyclone Amphan, hit the area and completely blew away Mrs. Sada's home, a home made of bamboo, wood, plastic, tarpaulin. And thankfully, Calcutta Rescue was around to provide her with raw materials to rebuild her home. But she reflects on how things have changed. And when she was growing up, she used to uh, fish uh, and catch crabs and sell them in the Sundarbans markets. And uh, how with repeated storms, the land has become salty, no longer fertile. The ponds, the freshwater ponds in which the rohu fish were grown have disappeared and people are no longer able to make a living and they've migrated into the slums of Calcutta. Now, I want to leave Mrs. Sada for a while and we'll come back to her in about 10 minutes and we'll go to chapter 2. Chapter 2 begins on the streets of Calcutta about 50 years ago. It then moves to Zurich in June of this year, and then back to Calcutta. So let me take you back 50 years. An amazing humanitarian doctor, Dr. Jack Prieger, a British, GP, uh, a British doctor, started treating people on the streets of Calcutta. Today, the organization has grown to almost 200 staff members. There's teachers, there's health educators, there are doctors, pharmacists, physiotherapists, psychologists, and they run four clinics, they operate uh, outreach clinics, there's TB, HIV clinics, there's a school, there's a, there's a workshop. And Calcutta Rescue probably has a presence in about 50 slums and probably a touch point, a potential touch point to about half a million people. Let's move now to, to Zurich. Every year, Calcutta Rescue has an international meeting where its donors from the Global North meet. And this year, in June of this year, a meeting was held in Zurich. And there was a move to have Calcutta Rescue focus more on the health consequences of climate change. 
it was stated, it, uh, there was sentiment that whatever the current health uh, risks and health um, problems faced by the, the slum dwellers are inevitably going to get worse with impending climate change. Now, Calcutta Rescue just embraced this concept wholeheartedly, and we needed, uh, and, but didn't know what to do. How did they Im get uh, climate change inculcated and, 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 and into its, uh, its business model and, its, uh, and, and in the population that it served? And that's where Isabel, Isabel, put your hand up. Is Isabel Hook is, our, is the Swiss support coordinator for Calcutta Rescue. And Isabel found us a WHO uh, operational framework, um, which, actually maybe we should move to that because we've, we've, we've moved to chapter three, found us an operational fr uh, framework that allowed Calcutta Rescue to hang and drape its, um, I its own unique policies and action on, a, on an existing framework. And um, Isabel really is, 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 our, is the moral compass, I would say, of, our, uh, of, 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 the, of the NGO. And the, the operational framework of the WHO structure had 10 main headings. And in fact, I'm so sorry that the, the reference to it at the bottom is, uh, is so small. But what Calcutta Rescue has done is, in a sense, I, I mean, Blaze is right, one size doesn't fit all. And what we did was take those 10 headings and decide what was relevant and what was applicable to our local circumstances. And these are the six headings that we, we came through, and I want to go through each one in turn. So under leadership, we set up, or Calcutta Rescue set up a working group to, uh, to integrate policy decisions or climate change policies. And the most important thing is that the CEO was part of this working group to give it the status, to give it the importance that it deserved. And one of the activities they're involved with is collaborating with, they realized they needed to collaborate with city uh, departments, primarily because the city provides uh, areas of, 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 of activity and services that the organization doesn't, from transport to energy to housing to solid waste disposal. And importantly, the third point about the leadership was that they, dis they require, that they, they're committed to getting the community engaged, the community in participating in these activities, and um, particularly on gender equality, we know that women are disproportionately going to die from the health effects of climate change. And so bringing educational programs into the schools and making sure that um, that education went out into the communities was, um, was an, important, uh, an important requirement. The workforce, we decided, the workforce needed to address three issues. One was disasters, um, pandemics or uh, extreme weather events. The second was environmental threats, um, whether vector-borne diseases or, um, or, 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 or heat or pollution. And addressing those three, um, oh, and, and the third one, of course, was the, the social dislocation from, from climate change. So the migration of people, into, into the cities, the um, poverty, job insecurity, the poor nutrition, and the mental health anxiety associated with, with all of that. So getting the workforce around those concerns was an important issue. Health information underpinned everything, and to identify community vulnerability, organizational gaps, as an early warning system and to support research. The technologies now, this, this includes medicine, vaccines, you know, we've talked about the health footprint of, of primary care. And I want to just show you, this is work done 
by the British Medical Association looking at the carbon footprint of UK general practice. And you can see that 75% of the carbon footprint of primary care in the UK is from, the pharma is from pharmaceutical prescribing. So coming back to this, what can Calcutta do about that? I mean, we assumed that there was a similarity in, in carbon footprints. Well, try and put pressure on the pharmaceutical companies to come up with carbon footprinting of all their medications so we can at least make a comparative decision about which products to, to use. And already the doctors are transitioning away from inhalers, the aerosol inhalers, which have tremendous greenhouse gas uh, emissions, to dry powder inhalers, which, which, which don't have quite the same uh, uh, emissions. We've also encouraged the doctors to prescribe less, to rationalize the prescribing. And we've heard much of this already today. And to think about social prescribing, um, natural, uh, nat natural born, uh, natural health interventions, um, uh, looking at group activities and exercise and, and, uh, and the like. And service delivery closely follows on from the workforce planning. Um, so I don't really want to spend that much more time on it. And we come to the financing. Now, Calcutta Rescue realizes that mitigation and adaptation are going to cost. We realize that uh, these devastating weather events are going to destroy our infrastructure. Uh, in fact, uh, two years ago, they blew the roof off the main clinic. We know that um, drugs and vaccines in times of high demand will be high, so we need to build in to our uh, budgets these additional costs. And where's the money going to come from? Well, up until now, it's mostly been the Global North, volunteering in, in, in Europe and America. But now Calcutta Rescue is starting to attract new money from business and, and corporates in, 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 um, in India itself. So my three take-home points is we need leadership, leadership to encourage change in behavior. Now, I didn't hear this morning too much about change in behavior. We have to change our diets. We have to change our means of transport. We have to change, I mean, yes, the way we heat our homes. And we need leaders to encourage people, to lead them forward. And, uh, you know, the British current prime minister, I forget who it is, we change them so often, but he's refused to go to, to COP27 on the grounds that he's too busy at home. I mean, you know, what, is, what message does this send out to, to the world? The second point I want to make is that um, we NGOs have a particular responsibility. We have to be role models. We have to hold the torch. We have to shine the light for people to follow. And uh, we have to lead by example. And finally... Yeah, one size does not fit all, but there are toolkits, there are manuals, there are guidelines out there which we can modify and adapt to our own particular circumstances, and we don't have to, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, is, is my final point. And there's a postscript to, to this presentation, and that's to come back to Mrs. Sada. Now, We've got her permission and her family's to use this photograph. That's Mrs. Sada, her son and her daughter. And this is their current, pla th th their current house, made of wood, made of bamboo, made of plastic. I mean, what chance does this have of surviving another cyclone? Although the story to Mrs. Sada has not yet been written, of course, I have to say that I don't think it's a fairy tale ending. That doesn't mean that it couldn't be a hopeful one. And her vulnerability will depend on the world rapidly transitioning away from fossil fuels. It'll depend on international organizations, governments, NGOs to help the poor, the dispossessed, um, the marginalized, the discriminated against from the effects of climate change. And if we do that, then Mrs. Sada, her family, and her community um, know that they're not alone in, in, in facing a very uncertain world. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. <laughs> um, would you please like to take a seat on the panel? And I would like to join our last two um, presentators, Hafid and Blaise, to the stage as well. We're going to have some good five minutes, I think, um, to take some questions from this room, but also um, there might be some online. Um, I would like to start with um, Alan. Does someone has um, any input or question directed to him and the, his presentation? Yes. Oops. I'm going to give you that one. There you go. Can everyone? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's on. Uh, is it on? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alan. This is uh, I'm Francisca Freiburghaus from SEC, uh, newly responsible for uh, Terre des Hommes Suisse. <laughs> um, yeah, you said decolonizing aid. So this is really a, a big you word. You 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 put yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> I talk to you. Is it for Alan or is it for Blaise? Go ahead, just okay. go ahead. <laughs> okay, no, you said uh, you, you put that word uh, on the slide. So this is really a big, a big thing. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more about that? What you mean, what their own uh, um, mean, what it means for their own? Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to be brief and not to lose myself in many explanations, but um, I think before we, st we um, one important thing um, that I want to add is we are developing a strategy 2030. And that strategy is not developed on the desk of the director's board in Basel and then presented to the team. It's a joint um, process that is also including all the discussions we, that were tackled by the crisis, the climate crisis and the, the, um, the reduction that we want to take to, to, to have. Um, the, the whole development sector, and I'm really I'm being on the broad lines, huh, is um, we are still operating on structures, whether they are economical, historical, social, etc. We're still working in a system that is deeply affected by the colonial past and also the post-colonial development of the last decades. Um, there is a power dynamic, and um, there is also, and it, and it affects several sectors. Now, decolonizing aid is a lens to tackle all of these, all of the um, roles we want to play, all the structures we want to play, to, to, to have, and ultimately to decide on who is actually um, benefiting from this work, and how much do they really have a say on shaping the way development aid and the development sector is working. To put it very simple, like very simple, and the answer is that the access is very low actually, and we're still taking most of the decisions and knowing what's right for um, much of, I would say, um, le, le more, uh, much of societal illnesses that are still being created in the north. I'm very, I'm very polemic here. The reality is very much nuanced, of course. But in the broad lines, um, lines I think this is where it is. And I'm very careful um, to say this is what Terre des Hommes Schweiz is going to do. I'm, um, because this is really a process I want to elaborate with my colleagues and we'll find answers that are sustainable. It's not just about having this is what we're going to do because I think it's right. I think. Any process needs to be discussed, needs to be planned. I talked about the roadmap. And this can be applied to any sector. So there will be a discussion without the fundraising or financial team. There will be a discussion within the programming team. There will be a discussion, discussions um, in the communication team, and so on, to elaborate a proper plan and to define for ourselves as an institution what decolonizing our work means on the longer run. I hope, I hope it's, it's uh, yeah? So. <laughs> I think uh, maybe this could be uh, the topic uh, of the next, uh, maybe this could be uh, the seminar. You know, it's such a big topic. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's very difficult to give an answer to that. I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
thank you. Um, I'm going to quickly turn to Amélie. Do we have some online comments or questions for our panel? No, we don't. We still have, yes, I'm near here, so let's save a little bit of time. I'm going to come to you in a second. There you go. Thank you. Um, I have a question, I think, for Bless and for, um, for uh, Hafid. Um, Hafid, you, you talk about uh, the Yoss you are working with, the, the yo young generation, and I know that uh, the Zonkites is doing a lot of work, so you have uh, a lot of young activists. And um, we, we are confronted with a, a big problem. We have very uh, old donors, and we are really looking uh, to address the, the, the generation like they are now tw between 25 and 35, so they are academics, and we really realized that they were not engaging financially. So I need like an elevator, elevator pitch to convince them in 30, mi 30 seconds in a leaf how to, to, s to tell them that, that we need the money to do things. Um, uh, difficult question. Uh, on my side, we are, for financing, we are targeting more the 40 to 65, because uh, I think the one, the 25 to 35 are the one that we want to engage and to be activists or, you know, not just communicating. I think this terms of activists is, is, is a bit difficult to uh, accept for quite a number of people. And we have a lot of discussion now uh, in the universities because we are engaging and uh, some people from the parliament or the, the local government say we are spitting in the soup because we are paid by uh, the government and we are saying that the government doesn't do uh, the work uh, correctly. And uh, so we really try to make s scientists aware that they have uh, the duty to communicate not only the results of their findings, but also how, what kind of solution uh, can be discussed with politicians. And uh, a lot of people saying uh, uh, scientists should be n neutral. That doesn't exist. I mean, scientists need to be objective, to look at evidence and then uh, discussing. So it is not exactly for the question, but the, the, the financing, what we see actually when we try to get uh, financing for our action or for interventions or whatever, actually I go to my friends because uh, uh, we, we have a network and that's, you don't have a network at 25 or it's more difficult to have a network for financing when you are 25. When you are, when you are 45 or, or, or 60 or 65, the network can be uh, larger and that's where we go for financing. I don't know if uh, I responded to your question. Maybe Alan? Ah, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, can I just, um, just very briefly describe the, the business model that uh, Calcutta Rescue uses? We encourage young North, uh, North Europeans to go to Calcutta as work experience, just to see how the organization runs in the hope, in the long-term hope, that when they return, they're inspired and provide ongoing uh, donor support. And uh, that's worked reasonably well, I think, to date. Um, I will first stop, before I answer the, uh, try to answer the financial question is, um, we work with youth and we try to establish in every country a youth network of youth delegates who can be vocal for the youth group. So in every organization and partner we work with, we want two representatives. And I've, re I've been working um, for 25 years now in the youth sector, whether I was involved and then part of the, as a youth worker and then at certain time working with youth organizations. I know how easy it is to appoint two youth that can speak on behalf and then you can, it's tokenism and you can really easily um, I've been working in the MEDA regions for a long time, uh, Mediterranean regions, Arab states. You have the youth representatives. It's usually youth that come from a very privileged background. Um, I'm 
and I don't want to say it's, um, it's wrong per se, but the chances for social change coming from these, these generations is, is very difficult. If you really want to build up a representative structures with youth, um, it takes time. You need to work with them, train them, give them the ability, the capacity to, to have their voice. That's one. Um, as one way to give, actually, if you, if you say you work with youth, what do you do to really make them influence your work? That's one. And then what you're addressing is, um, and you, you understand now why I'm, I'm getting there, is Terezom Schweiz today, most of the donors, I would say, um, are 50, 55 plus of the private donors. It's a, it, I think it's not very different from, from the other organizations. But if you want um, youth to, um, the younger generations to um, involve themselves financially, um, are they part of your, your work? And are they part of your organizational work? Do they, um, if, if you take some, I'm, I'm not going to name organizations, but the youth organizations that have young people in the decision making of the organization, they are the ones that are likely to motivate people not to only give money, but really give their time and resources to be active. And that's one of the, the answers there. If you really want to involve the young people to be active, you need to include them in your work. Whether you want to do that and that makes sense, that's, I mean, that every organization needs to answer that. But I think that's one possible way for me. Thank you. Yes, I think um, you had a question before? Yes, it was. Yes, was for Alan. Um, thank you very much for the inspiring story about Calcutta. Um, I believe you mentioned a very important notion, <coughs> the notion of behavior change. And I think we all know in our projects that's often the, the most difficult thing to achieve and it takes time, it takes a long time. So I am familiar with the WHO framework for climate resilience, but can you talk a little bit around you know, the health facilities, um, what, how, how challenging was it to uh, obtain that behavior change also with the people who were the healthcare staff? And so how, how, yeah, how challenging was that aspect? It's an ongoing project, and y you know they're becoming. We're all becoming sensitised to the need to change, and it's it's about that decision. You know, cycle. You pre-contemplation, and then finally you contemplate, and then you do something about it. And it's about um, providing the evidence, giving the information <laughs> to encourage people to make the right choices, and uh, you know, come back to leadership. You know, for leaders in charge and involved, and. Uh, Joydeep uh, Chakraborty, the, lead, the CEO of the, of the organization, is completely committed to this, which actually makes it relatively easy. And uh, I say relatively because we're, none of us want to change our behaviors. We all want to get in the car and drive to work in the morning. And, uh, you know, it needs really powerful role models and, and influences to, to get us you know, moving away from that, uh, that paradigm. But... Yes, it, it's, it, it's a work in progress. Thank you. We are running a bit over time. I'm going to give you the last question for this panel. Go ahead. Concerning Calcutta project, uh, I wonder how many people can we reach with your project? So can you say, uh, has your ways of doing been replicated in some other place or in other in your surrounding areas? I don't know the answers to whether it's being replicated, but I think that if we can establish uh, a beacon out there, then yes, I think part of our moral responsibility would be to somehow get best practice um, w widely publicized. And this is the first opportunity that I've had to to talk about it, and so, you know, the June meeting in Zurich was the beginning, and we've come a very long way since then, but in a year's time, I'm hoping we'll have, uh, you know, we'll be able to tell other NGOs or other forums how, um, how we did it, and, and, and hopefully spread the, good, spread the message. Thank you. So I think it's time for us to close this part, and there will be a vegetarian um, lunch in the um, foyer 
and we'll meet in an hour again here for the, um, the afternoon sessions. Enjoy your lunch, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.
who
discussion yesterday about this. It's okay. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, one, two, three. No. You have to switch it off. One, two, one, two, three. It will work when I'm. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's okay. Good. Welcome back to our uh, afternoon session. Uh, I hope you had a good lunch. I hope you had coffee and you are ready to go on uh, in this afternoon. It looks like. So just maybe to recall this morning, we had, uh, we had a first part where we digged into the topic in a, on a quite systematical level. We saw on one hand side the the, the challenges we have if we just want to address the, uh, the, the climate crisis in the framework of the current system. There were quite uh, deep discus discussions around how what, what changes is are needed or that there is na changes needed in the economic system as well to adapt uh, for our programs. We had more concrete examples. We saw the situation in, at the Aral Sea in a very impressive presentation. And we have as well uh, reflected on how organizations of the International Health Corporation could react on it and how they do this uh, at the moment. We had uh, heard from Hafit and Terdesom Schweiz their way, their process they are in, and we heard as well from Kalkutsta Rescue where they are already in this process. Uh, Monica Cristofori from Swiss Red Cross has as well posted something. I just give this back, just a remark. She writes from Swiss Red Cross. We have a climate policy in place, place which also regulates who should fly abroad and for what reason. We are much more reflecting now where and how the HQ headquarters really needs to be involved. However, the understanding is not the same in all departments. That is something we heard as well uh, um, this morning. For example, communication thinks that they, till that they still need to fly very in a, to, to very every country to write beneficiary stories for the marketing. Here is the limit that even if you have a policy as an organization, it requires the personal. And we hope that all marketing uh, departments from all our member organizations, everyone has a marketing department, I suggest, I suppose, um, um, have heard this as well. And we know this discussion, and this is coming back to uh, um, what Francisco Freiburg has as well mentioned and um, wanted to point it out. There is a need to debate really on decoloniality within the network Medicus Mundi Switzerland. And this is exactly what we are doing. We have started this year already with a round table. We will publish a bulletin this December and it's still possible to write articles for it. So if you feel inspired, please uh, address yourself to our responsible person for communication, to Martina. And uh, so th I think these debates are really, and this was interesting, I think, this morning, these are interla interlinked um, uh, topics. So we come to the afternoon session, and we go to another crisis, where we have seen as well all these crises are um, interlinked, but now we address really a another crisis. And it's the violent conflicts around the, the uh, violence conflict around the world, and connect them with the other with the other crises in the world. First, I'm really glad to announce that we have Stuart Wellis of the Swiss Agency for Development, Development and Cooperation here. We will hear on SDC's reaction to the humanitarian impacts of Russia's war against Ukraine and how SDC is aiming to bring humanitarian aid and development cooperation, the famous nexus, uh, together. Stuart has a PhD in physics and a master in rene renewable energy and sustainable building technologies from the FN FHNW. This is the University of Applied Science of Switzerland's northwestern region. I think I've got it right. Uh, yes, Stuart. 
and you can welcome Stuart as well. Is it working? Yeah, it's working. Yeah. Okay, great. You should stand a little bit in the light. Okay, I'll stand in the light. Um, yeah, it's good to be in Basel. Um, I was telling some people in the break, um, I, I live close to Basel. I live in Oberville. And uh, the reason I'm in Basel is because of uh, Medicine Sans Frontier. I met my wife in uh, 2001 in Sri Lanka. She was a doctor for MSF and I was a technician in a, in a hospital there. Um, and she has a medical practice in Basel. So that's why we live here. Um, a little bit um, before we start on this, I think something which maybe will inform the talk is a little bit to talk about uh, the reorganiza reorganization of SDC. I think a few of you may be aware, or maybe many of you are aware, that uh, since 1st of September we have a new organization which is uh, um, a bringing together of humanitarian and development um, together inside SDC. What does that mean practically? Practically, um, that we don't have any more humanitarian desks and development desks. So geographic desks are together. There's one person who is responsible for humanitarian and development response, and he is normally the budget holder for, for, uh, for NGOs. Um, that, is the, that is one person. And I think this is a, a very necessary and a very welcome step. There is some other um, changes which you, which you might have seen, which you might notice. Um, we have uh, now... Uh, people who work in both in the humanitarian side and in the development side. So, and I'm uh, an example of that. I'm 50% working for H operations in sanitation and hygiene and 50% working in section health. It's really to try to bring these two, these two sides of SDC together to, to work together. So um, that's, that's a change. Another one is that we are developing, I don't know if you're aware, but we have um, expert groups on the humanitarian side. This is commonly known as the core. Um, we have 12 of them, so these are, uh, in, we have an expert group medicine, uh, WASH, uh, DRR, protection, um, uh, cash, I mean there's, 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 there's all these different groups and this is a malicious system where people like me, which is what I did between 2010 and 2020 um, for STC, where you, where you have a, a, a life outside of STC, they call you and then you can go on mission in, in different kinds of deployment, so one would be um, as a set, so for the Einsatz team, which is the emergency team. Um, uh, another one would be a direct action where you go um, to support a, a Swiss project. Uh, and the third modality would be uh, a secondment, which is the one I mostly did uh, in, in those 10 years from 2010 to 20. So you're seconded to a UN organization and you support them uh, for a short period of time until they can find personnel. Um, so. Another change that, you, that, you, that we are working on at the moment, it's not through yet, is to develop our expert group medicine to expand its competence and they would be then an expert group health and they would then be able to support the whole of SDC in the health decision making. It's a, it's a big competence, it's 80 doctors and nurses and health professionals. So that's, that's another change. So that maybe slightly informs um, uh, what I'm gonna do now, which is to talk about the actual example of Ukraine. So um, what we did. I'll just talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the Ukrainian example of SDC. So previous to the invasion of, um, of February, uh, SDC was active uh, in Ukraine supporting the government. Um, and there was four main areas of intervention. And the health, uh, the health outcomes, um, I've written it, that's just taken from the cooperation uh, program. Um, and another one I'd like to point out there, um, which is quite important, uh, is this one here, the democratic institutions. So there was a reform which was instigated by the Ukrainian government, where they decentralized a lot of, they changed from the old Soviet system to a newer decentralized system. And this uh, included a lot of changes in health and wash in water and sanitation, border canal. They changed how they, they were budgeted and how they were funded and how the decisions were making on what that funding was used for. It was taken from central authorities and pushed as much as possible down to local level. And I think that made quite a big difference um, to the resilience of, the, of those uh, institutions. I just want, there's a few projects of, uh, of STC projects uh, in Ukraine prior to the, to the current uh, um, uh, invasion on the 24th of uh, February. Um, mental health, 
uh, health sector reform and NCDs were, 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 were three of the projects. There was some humanitarian programming already going on since 2014. I think you maybe had seen it if you're Swiss on the media, these convoys of, uh, of material that went across the front line uh, in the east of Ukraine uh, that was supported by Swiss, negotiated by Swiss, and uh, this was to do with um, water treatment chemicals and some medical um, supplies went on these convoys. Um, a little bit of a discussion there about uh, governance uh, reform in Ukraine. So what was it? So um, the, the, the actual um, idea was to develop as much as possible community health. So that was a process that, that, was, uh, that was ongoing. Um, but of course, some, some uh, services are, are, are much more sensible when they're, when they're centralized. So vaccine pr procurement would be, would be one that stayed centralized. But as much as possible, reforms uh, inside Ukraine that the government of Ukraine were following through was supported by Switzerland uh, with technical advice, with uh, financing uh, uh, to, enable, to enable that decentralization process. And it's, it's certainly something I've seen. I mean, I, I've, I've worked in many, many crises when I'm, I'm really very, very aware of, of if you have a strong local government partner and you go there as a humanitarian response in a crisis, you're there then as a gap filler. You're there then as an additional support to the local response. You don't build a parallel structure. You, you help local people. And for me, that's, that's, that's really the, the core of localization and the core of resilience is in this uh, uh, local capacity. Um, so we could see, I, I think some things we could see on after the 24th is that the health system in Ukraine did not collapse. I think it was very resilient um, and, and it worked um, with, with obvious real problems with some of the targeting of health infrastructure, for example, uh, relocation of some of the medical personnel and services to the West uh, took care. Uh, but uh, but, but uh, in, in the main, in the main uh, they, they, they were quite resilient. Um, so STC, what did STC do? So we have, a, um, we have three examples um, of reprogramming or new programming associated with, uh, with the humanitarian response. So we have this example here, this is mobile medical teams. So uh, NCD's um, program was ongoing and uh, they were asked like, if, they, if they had a budget and what would they like to do. So this was uh, in, in, in consultation with the MOH of, of Ukraine. They made mobile medical teams and they went to, to, to areas uh, close to the front line to try to assist people. Um, what was maybe key, to pick out a couple of key things in here, um, was the, oh, sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, digital, the digital recording system. So every consultation was recorded digitally and this then made a database and this database was then useful, for example, in procurement. So, so normally in a humanitarian, with my humanitarian hat on, if we go, we go with a one size fits all model, we go with packs of stuff. It's not uh, maybe also re slightly related to climate uh, previously, it's not very efficient, it's like you have everything. But if you have this, this recording of what the needs are, and then when you come to reorder, when you come to supply, you can, you can really say, okay, hy uh, hypertension is like something that we, we really need more of um, and something else we need less of. So you can really, like, it really informs your response and makes your re response much more efficient. So that was one uh, big uh, uh, plus that came out of this, uh, this digitalization uh, component of, of the response. And, um, and also then the fact that uh, it's something I see as well in other contexts with the, with the emergency team. If you go with an emergency team and you provide a supply, you get a lot of information from the, from the population on what they need. And one of the things that they found was the disability and the elderly, the needs for social care, which were not really on the radar of the humanitarian community at the time. So that was a, a population that could flee, fled, um, and population that were unable to, elderly, disabled, could not, and there was huge social care needs there. So that was uh, something that was able to be passed on to the humanitarian community. Uh, another um, repro reprogramming example was mental health. Um, so the, uh, I, I think you probably all saw on the media that there was a, a, a large uh, uh, flow of people um, coming through uh, Lviv, uh, Lviv became a very large center for IDPs. So mental health um, programming, which was already on, ongoing, this idea to, to bring mental health services to the community, 
that was a program which was which was there already, and that was able to be reorientated to to try to support uh, this huge flow of people through um, through the beef and for IDPs. Um, one example of a need there is this is this a massive I mean probably not not surprising this massive increase in PTSD uh, requirements for mental health is uh, is there and uh, future needs uh, developing community support for PSD, PTSD. Um, and this is an example of an actual a new humanitarian uh, program uh, in health which has uh, uh, just been started. Um, so rehabilitation of victims of trauma. So obviously, I mean, I think, I think it's clear that there's a lot more trauma victims. It's something that the, the Ukrainian health service was not uh, set up for before, and now they have this new reality. Uh, they have to deal with it. So SDC is um, supporting, there's the, uh, just to pick out a couple of things, there's the, the, the training program. So to, to integrate trauma into uh, the training of medical personnel, that's, that's ongoing, but it does need expanded. Um, I think another thing here was this, uh, this expansion of the program through other donors. Uh, you um, saw the program and they, they started to expand the program, so that was a, that was a big plus. Additional equipment uh, required and also um, additional elements need to be, need to be supplied. So there's, there's, a, there's a, uh, an obvious uh, um, need for extra components to that program. It's very basic at the moment in, in what it does. Uh, in equipment and in, uh, and, in, and in the work that they do, but it could, it could definitely be expanded. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, did I take you by surprise? <laughs> you, are, you are too fast for me, <laughs> you are <really> too fast. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stuart Realis, on these insights um, of of your of SDC's work in Ukraine, and uh, yes, I think uh, uh, this shows now really, uh, and as well, uh, I can imagine this is really now the challenge is really to bring to bring uh, development components together with humanitarian components, and I saw both in it. I think this was uh, quite interesting, and it's certainly as well something where we can talk uh, afterwards uh, more in deeply as well when we uh, come back afterwards if after we have heard the other uh, the other presentation so I would just say we just continue so you are relieved for the moment and uh, we would uh, continue and and now uh, you know it's, it's this was really fast too fast for me but uh, somehow I manage, like always. So we come to the next uh, next uh, presenta presentation, and we will have from uh, Lasha Bogwache from the International Federations of the Red Cross an, an important uh, reflection on climate change and displacement, the growing health concern. And I think this now shows as well what we are now coming to, how these uh, the IFSCR we know very much um, as well from, from humanitarian side of actions. And I think it shows now really how these different dimensions of crisis we are in now come together and how they are uh, really a challenge for many of us. And we are grateful to have you here and that you can uh, present how you solve these challenges. Thank you. It's on. Thank you very much for the invitation. I, I would wish that I, I, we all know how to resolve uh, um, um, these issues. I think we 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 still in the in the process of learning. So uh, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, so uh, it's uh, uh, and particularly it's not easy after such a rich discussions in the morning to continue. But uh, I, I hope that I will bring some 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 new elements. Uh, so just really, uh, whoever doesn't know, I'm sure 
um, you know, so I, I represent the International Federation of Red Cross Red Crescent Societies. It's part of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. We have some colleagues who were working before uh, there, so at least two I know um, uh, with the International Committee of the Red Cross. And we have Monica now online who was mentioned representing Swiss Red Cross. So this is three, three parts of, of, of the movement. Uh, national societies, we are talking about 192 Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. Uh, so we are talking about International Committee of Red Cross and we are talking about International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent societies. So uh, the, uh, having the same, excuse me, yeah, okay. So, um, I will, uh, so I, I, I will not go into the technical details with, with, this, uh, uh, with this rich audience. So I just go to the, some snapshots uh, of three uh, key uh, problems for today. Uh, so it's climate, it's migration, and health. So um, how it works. Okay. So we know that climate change uh, is increasing reason for uh, displacement and, uh, and uh, migration. So, I mean, the World Bank uh, um, ground was well reports that, okay, if there is no uh, actions taken by 2050, uh, climate change can lead to more than uh, 200 million people to migrate. Okay, we don't need to go to 250, so we have, we have some results uh, the, from the recent years. So Internal Displacement Monitoring Center, IDMS, reported that between 2009 and 2019, yearly average uh, 22 million people were displaced by different type of uh, hazards, including floods, storms, etc. So, uh, so we don't need to, to project uh, 20 years after. So uh, on the other hand, we know how climate affects health. Uh, and again, so we talked about this a lot. I mean, we just, I just really want to mention that WHO estimates 250,000 deaths per year between 2030 and 2050 if no, uh, no attention is uh, provided. So there is, there is clear linkages and interaction between climate change, between displacement and health, and this is quite complex. Uh, so who is affected most? Again, we, we, we talked, uh, we mentioned, we listened the, the stories from uh, different countries. Who is poorest and who is marginalized? The people who have very limited resources to access health and care services. They have very limited adaptive capacities. Uh, yeah, and then basically they have uh, limited capacity to protect themselves uh, from disasters. Um, and uh, they live already uh, in the areas that are disaster prone or they are moved be be already because of different type of conflicts. And then in addition, uh, the, the, the climate change uh, poses additional challenges. Um, yes, some, some uh, yes, of course, in addition, needs to be mentioned uh, that sometimes women and girls are in a prof uh, disproportionately impacted, um, where particularly um, they have uh, unequal access to the resources and decision-making capacities, and um, so particularly um, in the, in the um, uh, areas with, uh, facing high poverty, where they also experience forced displacement and uh, um, um, sometimes uh, uh, experiencing vulnerabilities to sexual violence and the lack of access to sexual and reproductive health. This morning we also mentioned this. Uh, So people who are forced to move, they uh, they exposed to many health risks. I don't go to, we are talking about communicable or non-communicable mental illnesses for sure. 
So access to, to, to services are disrupted, um, including the primary health care and in many, um, in many cases, continuity of the health and care. Uh, so where people are moving, in, in some cases, the host communities, they also do not have the strong health systems. And negative health outcomes is concerning displaced communities as well as the host communities. So it's additional burden. Um, so and but also also I think uh, nevertheless need to be mentioned and I will bring some examples. Uh, so we may talk about the voluntary climate related displacement in the in the in more safe areas and maybe in the communities where the health system is stronger. In this case and with good uh, anticipatory and preparatory measures, the health uh, risks can be minimized. So I just really want to bring a few examples with your permission from different countries. I mean, uh, so we take now uh, 2020 in the middle of pandemic. So Angolan citizens, uh, they started to cross the border to Namibia to search food, water, healthcare, employment because of the heavy drought in the country. So in collaboration with the Namibian government, the Namibian Red Cross was providing to Angolan citizens with food, shelter, blanket, mattresses, health services, community health services, um, regard irrespective of their legal status. So this, uh, this small example shows the uh, importance of uh, coordination between countries and in our case collaboration between the, the national societies like Angola Red Cross and Namibia Red Cross. So I bring another example uh, in Yemen for instance. Uh, we know the, the, the complexity of the situation and uh, protracted armed conflict that is intensified again 2020 in the, in the, in the middle of the, the pandemic and then that increased the mm, uh, number of displaced up to three, four million and humanitarian situation already very bad. So then extreme flooding came up and uh, then, you know, brought uh, or registered many uh, cases of infectious diseases, uh, whether it's cholera, dengue or malaria or diphtheria and then you have 300,000 additional people who previously already displaced from one place to another one because of the conflict and they have to move again. So, and so whom we have in place, we have community organizations in place, example, for instance, Yemen Red Crescent Society, and they, they can provide support what they can, of course, in, in, in coordination with their governments, whether this is the, the, the basic health or psychosocial care. So whether we are talking about distribution of hygiene materials, uh, shelter kits, um, essential items to the people. So um, now, if we move now to Samoa, Samoa, we all know that this is very much disaster for an air, for, for, with tropical cyclones and long history with climate related displacement. So we know the geography, so, and we know that 70% of the country's population infrastructure is at the, uh, can I say, coastal level or sea level. So, and then, uh, so, um, and uh, so when sea level rises, basically, you know, people, uh, have, uh, are at risk to lose their houses. Um, so, and then, so with the, with the right communication, uh, prior working, um, inclusiveness, and really bringing some anticipatory actions in place. Uh, so um, the, the people decided to voluntarily reallocate themselves in line. So, what can we do now again as a, as a community-based partners like Samoa Red Cross? They accompany those families, they completely engage them in the process and um, also uh, in, in engage even family members who are moving in preparation uh, of 
the places and the local adaptation process and training uh, yeah, and many maintaining harvesting system. So that shows basically that there are also with the, with the right uh, um, uh, planning uh, to uh, try and minimize in some areas the, uh, the, the devastated effect of climate and uh, displacement. So, uh, well, just I would like to share with you so our m messages and directions. So first of all, uh, again, I will repeat, uh, no problem. So the localization. Localization is in the, in the heart of our organization. So we are talking about the local actions, communities in the center, access to the community and wash services, health and wash services. So um, we talked, uh, but uh, so o on the climate finances, but when we are talking about climate finances, it must include the health. So uh, uh, while, so basically, I mean, uh, because health is in, in important and inclusive component of the, of the climate change. So we should not expect that, you know, one ministry allocates money only for health and another one for the, uh, so they need to work together. So I don't know, but at least, you know, climate finances should include health. So um, community resilience, we, we, we talked empowerment, inclusion, uh, uh, equity, uh, protection, gender, uh, should be part of the, uh, the activities. Um, so, I mean, we are now all working uh, towards the universal health coverage agenda, we know, and unless the, the climate-related health issues or migration-related health issues are uh, uh, appropriately addressed, how can we achieve universal health coverage or uh, the um, global health security agenda? So these are two, two big agendas that uh, we are driving towards together with many others. But I think because of pandemic now, the global health security agenda also um, became as, as a top priority. Yeah, and one of the, uh, one of the, the kind of interlinkages between universal health coverage and global health security agenda is One Health, together with the health system strengthening and the, the health workforce. And that's where I put the, the role of community health workers and volunteers also, also in, the, in, in, in this area, their education and their, uh, the, their role is invaluable. So we need to promote, uh, you know, who, I mean, uh, my organization, uh, um, national societies, you know, we come uh, with around 14 or 15 million volunteers. I mean, not only health, but so uh, importance is really to, to have the close co collaboration and coordination with the national human resource systems where, where, where their role should be recognized. Yeah, and uh, disaster risk, risk reduction and anti anticipation. This is also very important. So I, I brought a small example from Samsa, Samoa. So basically, um, that's what I wanted to say. Just, uh, just last thing related to the collaboration with the, between the national societies. So when, when you brought the, the Ukrainian example, so um, uh, February, May, I spent uh, working on the, um, uh, as a part of the team, working uh, on the borders of uh, Poland, uh, um, Hungary, um, Slovakia, uh, Moldova. Uh, so I see, I see how those societies were working together. Um, also in line with the, uh, I think, uh, the, the huge solidarity that the, that the governments really um, expressed during this period. So, uh, so uh, importance of the, the, the mental health issues because I mean, no one cross border and tells that, you know, so I have uh, uh, some chronic diseases, you know, the first thing is, the, is to, to make person calm. But, and, but uh, of course the system needs to be established that people have continuity care and treatment. Uh, and then I moved to the west part of Ukraine uh, uh, where uh, we worked with the different organizations with internally displaced, um, 
so uh, I would wish that, uh, so, uh, I mean, some, we try to include uh, uh, some of the climate elements, but maybe in this context um, it was impossible, but maybe in the future we need to think, you see, you mentioned also the mobile, uh, mobile uh, teams. Now, so I don't know how, ma how many hundreds of mobile teams teams are function, uh, now functioning now in Ukraine uh, by different organizations. So how it works on the climate in addition to the ongoing conflict also needs to be um, what type of cars using, et cetera. So, I mean, I think this, this, is, uh, this is other discussion, but also, also to, to keep in mind. So we mentioned uh, today the, the COP27. Of course, you, I mean, you, you, you all know about it. So I just, just a reminder, the, the, the presidency teams, water, energy. Well, in the agenda, to be honest, uh, you know why I, I in, okay, water and gender is there, uh, but health as such, I could not find. Um, So uh, those are the, the topics for the negotiation, key, key topics, loss and damage, adaptation, and climate and finance. So 100 billion was uh, committed, and I think, uh, if I'm, I'm not wrong, I think uh, they are at around 80 million billion. So yeah, and, and also I want to share, even though so there may be there is no strong health agenda in the bigger agenda, WHO um, has the pavilion. So, so it's, uh, I think, uh, so, uh, and also the, the remote linkage is available. And I think so we all need to connect to the sessions that we are interested. So by the way, we have the session together with IOM, WHO, Universal Health Coverage uh, 2030 on Saturday, 12th of November uh, on this issue, climate, uh, migration, uh, health towards universal health coverage. So if you go to the to WHO website or COP27 website, you can have the link. So in my knowledge, every day it will be one, uh, one link, and then uh, so we can attend any session uh, that we are interested. This is just for the sharing. Thank you very much. <laughs> WHO didn't ask me to do it, so I just, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted that we are, we are, I mean, this great community that we are as many uh, connected to the, to the health agenda uh, and influencing health agenda as possible. Thank you very much, uh, Lasha, as well, for these practical announcements at the end. Uh, very, very useful indeed. Um, we will publish the presentations on our website so you can have a look and find this uh, uh, very good practical uh, insights you've, uh, you've provided, provided us uh, with us. So um, let's move on and uh, now from Ukraine uh, in the first part we go now closer to a little bit as well lost parts of the world. I think we have the problem that all this conflict or this war, uh, this Russian war aggression against Ukraine, especially in Europe, uh, over, overtook all the discussions. But climate change has not gone and uh, the, the conflict situations in different parts of the world have not gone, but the problem is, and a little bit as well in Lasha's presentation, uh, there is as well a, a conquest internationally around uh, the financial resources, where put the money in and where bring it in, and uh, the international donors, they go now to Ukraine and forgot other parts of the world. So this is a problem, and we come now in the second part closer to uh, a little bit hidden conflicts or forgotten conflicts and we would start with a with a uh, with a presentation for the situation in Burkina Faso uh, I invite Thomas Rodriguez to join us here on the floor 
He's from Enfant de Monde. Has a, he has a background in social, economic, and development studies, and uh, has um, different field experiences for French Red Cross, Première Urgence International. He's now uh, joining, joined some months ago the Enfant du Monde team. And by this, welcome you as well in the Network Medicus Mundi Switzerland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be part of this meeting. And um, I will present how Enfant du Monde is facing security challenge in Burkina Faso on the lesson learned we had uh, from our starting reflection work on this topic. So I will present very quickly our way of work uh, to understand the, the following slides. Uh, we are committed in health promotion with uh, for, for maternal, newborn, and child uh, in health promotion by supporting the Ministry of Health in Burkina Faso and our partner. The important thing is we are not staff dedicated to the implementation directly on the fields. We are supporting with strategy, tools, uh, trainings, and we, are not, we are don't have a big team and staff in the field implementing activities. So to resume the context in Burkina Faso, uh, the country is facing a multifactorial crisis uh, with interrelated factor as um, politics, there is a second coup d'etat after the first one in only one year. We have uh, climate change with doubt, uh, seasonal floods uh, in the country. We have demographics issues with displacement of populations linked to insecurity. Since, two since 2015, Burkina Faso is facing all attacks by organized armed group who, are, who led to displacement of populations. Uh, the, during this summer, it was almost uh, two million of people uh, displaced internally. And that led to uh, the closure on the functional, uh, the minimum functional operate from health facilities. So we have in the conflict affected areas, almost 40% of the health facilities affected. We can see on the map that on the 13 districts, uh, health districts, eight are conflict affected by the uh, organized armed group attacks. Uh, on the organized armed group are using tension between the communities already in place and going because of climate change issues. So, Enfant du Monde uh, is still implementing and supporting activities in health districts where security can be managed, but we have to reduce our activities in some districts where the security is not allowed field visit, follow up on monitoring, we cannot access, even for authorities, even for our partner at the national level, we cannot reach some localities. So we engage a work to think how we can adapt to our intervention and we, we can be part of the response for humanitarian needs for the isolated population and communities we don't have access. So when localities are isolated, when uh, the health facilities are closed or with a very l low level of operating, how we can su support and how we can adapt. We, 
we, we know that there is an added value to to work to have a complement a complementarity between emergency and development. It's not something new, but in reality, to implement uh, this strategy and this approach on the fields for a development NGO as Enfant du Monde is not so easy. We try to be part of the humanitarian response uh, by submitting proposals to cover some needs, but as we were identified as a development NGO, not a humanitarian aid experience actors, uh, we, we don't get into these funds and as we try to integrate health promotion action as a complement of health care provision, uh, it was not considered as a priori priority. So on health, uh, we are learned that we have to, at the beginning from the designing of, of, of intervention, to think about several options of our mode of intervention and to select some criteria to, de to decide when we have to shift in another mode according to the context and the security context. So we are very dependent of our colleague uh, or in, the in the capital to analyze the, the context and sometimes they, uh, they feel that, okay, there is some security issues, but it will not be uh, in a long time, it will just short time and after we can go back to the activities. But sometimes the, the problem is during more months or, or years. So we have to reflect on a very method, a methodology about how deciding when to shift our mode of interventions. Also, we have to, to work on digital tools. Uh, we did it with the outbreak of COVID-19. We, for example, we have an application for maternal uh, health education and we include uh, awareness message about COVID-19. And we have to develop this to be more efficient when we have to think about remote actions. And in our project design, we have to think about remote actions when security is not, uh, security is become an, is an issue. And Burkina Faso is very tricky because uh, you have some area we are clear on after that they shift to insecurity uh, with a high level and it's very moving and it's difficult to anticipate which area will be affected or not by conflict and uh, we have to adapt in each time our activities and to, to, keep, to keep the partner or the, the people in the safe uh, working framework. We have to, to have to work in partnership to, to have more partnerships at the micro level uh, with uh, community-based association and even we have a, a national partner but it's not able to reach uh, isolated community with, because of this insecurity and um, he, he is not able to do the monitoring and the follow-up follow of, of our ongoing activities because of the security, security matters. So we have to uh, link more with uh, actors and associations uh, at, the, at the very local level. And to be more efficient and to try to be attractive to have partnership with international or national medical NGO to work uh, as a complement to provide health promotion um, with the medical provision and health care provision together and to have an integrated approach. And linked to that, we have to do some advocacy to, to, to convince the donors, institutional donors, to fund our uh, integrated approach, to, to fund uh, health promotion in emergency context. We try to do that because we have an education sector who is responding to the emergency in Burkina Faso for uh, education in emergency context. We try to 
add some health promotion elements for the children displaced. Uh, we benefited from the activities on the health education in emergency context. But as I told, uh, health promotion was not a priority and we cannot uh, add this package uh, to have a more integrated approach. So that's why we already say that we have to promote the recognition, the recognition and development of the synergy between the sectors, as for example, for Enfants du Monde, health and education. So I was, as I told, developing apps, and uh, I, I thank the Professor Janton to warn us that app, there is still some, limit, some limits, and we have to be careful because there, there is some limits about uh, the connection network in Burkina Faso, armed groups are destroying communication network. So we have to think about uh, how to be efficient with our app because we develop some uh, training e on e-learning, on application, on mobile phone, we can be consulted offline, but there is still the matter of the access for population to have access to, to the application in the such context where security is very, very, uh, unstable and communication networks uh, down. So um, it's, um, it's a part of our reflection work. We started at Enfants du Monde because we are still working in Burkina Faso on promoting health promotion, but we had to remove from some district area and we are still uh, very frustrated to not be able to provide a response and to be part of the um, humanitarian response as a development NGO. Sometimes it's difficult for us as well to be part of the humanitarian health cluster because we don't have some results to present and some activities to present in the humanitarian action to be, to be part of the response for the displaced population and isolated population. We don't have an access to care and an access of quality care um, in Burkina Faso. So thank you for having paying attention. And uh, as there is some experts and specialists here, if you have some advice to support our reflection work about how to adapt our activities to be more uh, agile in the such context, thank you very much to share with us, and we will be glad to discuss it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. For, uh, for these um, um, useful inputs from your lessons learned, and it uh, connects as well to Stuart's, uh, um, Stuart's presentation before, how we connect these different fields, uh, development field and, and, and humanitarian field, and we see it's really a challenge, but it's great that you, uh, for Enfant du Monde, could share this short reflection on this aspect. This is, we go now to the next, uh, uh, to the next, it's not a presentation, so but we start with, a we continue now with a talk. It will be a little bit another setting, but, uh, and we, w we change again the region where we are focused on. We go now to North Syria, and I think you all recall uh, that some not so long ago we had quite a, 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 we had really a war there, a, a very tense situation for the people in in Syria, and we have somehow just forgotten about it. So we want to come back now to this conflict and and to hear how the Kurdish Red Crescent has reacted on it how the situation in Rojava and uh, uh, what is Medico International, uh, how Medico International are um, um, working, uh, working with their partners there. I think we come now from a really to a conflict that is somehow hidden again. It's a war still. The situation is bad, but I think uh, it's good to come this point and see what helps uh, what what uh, what this means for the the situation? What it means for the healthcare system in the region? I'm very happy. Maya um, 
Maya Hess, who is the president of Medico International, uh, is doing this talk to, with Sherwan Berry, uh, Dr. Sherwan Berry from the Kurdish Red Crescent. And welcome here in Basel, and uh, please take the chair and take the floor. And then in the second part of the, just a moment, yes, can welcome them. We will open up the discussion, this talk. We will open it up. I will take over for opening up to the speakers before and the discussion we had before. Do you want to sit? Yeah. You can sit if you want. But you should always should stay in the in the light. Right. If not, yeah. the you you are not seen uh, in the stream. Okay. So I will say Roshbash in Kurdish. Uh, have a good day. <laughs> Uh, these are the few words I learned in Rojava, so we will speak about the Rojava. It's a northeastern Syrian part, and I will welcome uh, Sherwan Berry. He graduated uh, as a dentist 2012. It was the beginning of the Syrian war and the beginning of the revolution in Rojava. So we have this year 10 years of revolution in Rojava. And you were four years the co-chair or co-director of Hevasor Accord or the Red Crescent, Kurdish Red Crescent in Rojava. Now you are uh, responsible for the international partnership. Uh, very welcome here. I'm happy to see you. And I'm Maya Hess, as you told, and I was working two years ago in Rojava also, like four months in uh, more in the mental health a field, I'm a psychiatrist, and I was, I did several visits to Rojava in the years before uh, 2000, or before the 2020. Okay, but let's start with my first question. When uh, Hevasor Akurd or Red the Kurdish Red Crescent started his work? How was the beginning? Okay, thank you so much, and uh, yeah, uh, hello everybody. Uh, as Maya said, I am Sherwan Bari. I am Syrian, Kurdish Syrian. And uh, I don't know if you are familiar with the Syrian map, let's say, and when they say uh, Rojava or so on, what does it mean? It's the north part of Syria, which the majority are Kurdish people. And uh, to be uh, um, very clear that the Kurdish Red Crescent is not part of the international community of the Red Cross, yet at least. But we are following the same principles since we started. And how we started that, <coughs> it was um, at the beginning of the Syrian crisis, the system was, as the colleague before was saying, was not at, as Ukraine, it was collapsing, and especially in the north part. And uh, due to the war, there was many, many injured people and uh, a lot of fight. You know, there was different uh, rebellion or so on fighting, especially Al-Qaeda or ISIS or so on. And there was no healthcare system, especially for those people and then for the primary health level, if you are seeing. That's why we as a uh, few doctors, uh, lawyers and so on, we started this NGO. And we randomly, honestly, called Kurdish Red Crescent somehow. But then we came in a bigger problem. Uh, when ISIS was rising up and so on after 2012, and let's say, uh, the people say it's the Kurdish region of the self-administration. Now it's not the Kurdish alone. It's many ethnics are living there. Maybe it's half are Kurdish, the rest are Arabic and Assyrian and other people as well. And uh, when ISIS was rising up in some Arabic region and there was fighting, uh, the self-administration forces went there. And again, there was nobody, no NGO, and this was the, the point. There was no NGO on the local level to help or rescue, especially for the Syrian government side. So we were the only one who could manage, and always, I think, as was mentioned before, the local NGOs always have accessibility and they know more 
how to find a solution than the international. That they always consider, uh, that's understandable of course, a lot of security things. So we could manage to go there and it's Arabic region, uh, honestly, and we are like the Kurdish ray tracing, but we always, uh, we're scared and I'm very frank here that maybe it will not be accepted. And as Kurdish person, we were, uh, since the very beginning, we are suffering from the Syrian government uh, view to the people that the, it's Syrian Arabic government, Syrian Arabic everything. We, we, there is no Kurdish in Syria. So we are, s we are already suffering from this thing and you don't want to duplicate it again in, in some other region. But fortunately, we are accepted very well and we have good community or uh, good relation with the local community and all our staff always are from the local region. And uh, yeah, this was the more or less the start and... And let me ask you, yeah. <laughs> you went to Shengal, it was the huge attack of ISIS to the, it was the genocide for the uh, Assyri people in Shengal in the Iraq. Mm -hmm. How many people were working there? How many from, from uh, Kur Kurdish Red Crescent? Mm -hmm. And how was it for you? It was really dangerous. Yeah, that's, that's right, and this was 2014, August yes. 2014, and by the way, I am also coming from the Yazidian minority, it's different religion. So the main or the major part are in this city in Iraq, and this is somehow making us thinking about the, the borders and the United Nations respond to there. 2014, there was no United Nations in all North Syria. It was only based in Damascus. And there was no response to more than 400,000 people in the Shingal region, it's in North Iraq, but on the border of Syria. So again, we have to do something against the law, let, let me say. We have to cross the border to Iraq without any permission, we have to do anything. And uh, yeah, we went there through a corridor that was also very difficult. And of course, uh, it was from both sides ISIS, but there was no chance. And uh, yeah, the military were opening the, the corridor and fortunately n no one of our staff were uh, injured or so on that time and more than 125,000 people could manage to come to North Syria and uh, yeah, then after one year more or less, the United Nations started to build of or to make offices in North Syria and started somehow and of course, I am not criticizing the United Nations, but I am uh, seeing and I am living in that, so I can see the Syrian government, how they block even the, the Red Cross or the Syrian uh, or the United Nations from doing their job through, um, let's say, uh, a legal way for themselves. Okay. Let me ask some personal question. How did you manage the stress and the fear? during the Shengal uh, attack of ISIS, <coughs> or the, the ISIS attack to Shengal? Okay, that's very, uh, very personal. I don't know how to answer, but honestly, I think it's, it was very beginning. We had a lot of energy. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, I think from the colleagues who were uh, with us, and uh, yeah, any NGO that start at the very beginning, they are volunteering. Mm -hmm. It's not like uh, you work, like uh, uh, there is a shift for you, there is a salary or so on. Mm. It was all voluntarily and it was not, I'm talking not about the Kurdish Red Crescent alone, but the local people of North Syria or the Kurdish people that time, all of them, they came with their cars, with their everything just to pick up the people. So we were not alone. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was August, so in August, it's not like in Switzerland, the temperature is more than 40 degrees. And those mm -hmm. people were walking for days in somehow a desert to reach Syria. So if you go to, uh, on that way, now you will see uh, the graves of children who were born on the way or died and their family couldn't bring them. But again, we had a lot of energy and uh, there was the local community, let's say the, in North Syria, the Kurdish who, uh, it was not only Kurdish Red Crescent, it was all the people and this is somehow a lesson to, to understand for the NGOs to know how to be integrated with the community and how to move mm. or mobilize them. Okay, it was a huge solidarity with the Assyrian people. How is the situation now in Rojava? 
Um, <coughs> I think now, now the, we, we, are doing, we are saying Rojava is not Syria, so it's part of, of Syria <laughs> again. And uh, unfortunately, um, and from my personal view, I think um, that the, the Syrian people doesn't have this, the, the talk now. Um, it's more mega powers, let's say, <laughs> because in the north there is the coalition led by the US, in south there is Russia, which is with the Syrian government, and in the northwest with the Islamic groups and so on, there is Turkey. So all these Syrian people, let's say, they cannot agree on any point without the blessing from the, the, the these mega powers. Another thing that we will talk about it after, I think, about the Ukraine war and that the media is focusing on that. There is a lot of, let's say, soft uh, attacks from Turkey, like with the drones. They uh, see some leaders or whoever, military, whether or civilian, and they make an attack and do it without media focusing. This year, until August, uh, there was more than 37 people, those are only civilian who were killed by the drones. And it's by Turkey, not by Syria. So it's always people thinking that uh, it's internal conflict within Syria, but no, it's also mm. in North Syria, all the attacks are from Turkish side. Mm -hmm. So they are violating international law. Yeah, of course. And um, of course they have agreement with the other, uh, with our other pow powers there. And if we talk about uh, economically also, this region is uh, more depending on the agriculture. And also they depend on the rain and there are two main uh, rivers, Euphrates and Tigris, that are passing from both sides. And on both uh, rivers also, Turkey making war uh, on, of, of water, that they are cutting the water for many times. Few months ago, we have a lot of cases of cholera. That was the first time I see it. Uh, I will say also this example. During uh, COVID uh, response, we were going to some camps and making awareness campaigns for the local. And for example, Al Hol camp. I think many of you heard about it. There are the families of ISIS and uh, other refugees from Iraq. There are more more than 60 Southern people. Ten of ten. 10,000 are international families. And we were going to tell them how to wash their hands and this kind of, let's, it became like routine of, of COVID. And they were saying, okay, there is no water. How you, you ask me to, to, to teach me how to wash my hands? So this is something is connected. Uh, the same with other diseases, like for, we are al also working in the detention centers, like there are 5,000 ISIS fighters now in those detention centers. It's really very uh, dangerous to enter, which is we understand that the local forces doesn't allow everybody to enter. And, but with, when we go, and especially after this problem in Hasleke city, I mean the water problem, uh, there are also many diseases that depend on the health. For example, there is, I think all of them get uh, tuberculosis. So, and uh, by the way, Medico was, in, uh, was involved in the water response. We were trying to bring water from different places to, to this city, which was the water cut it off. Yeah, can you shortly tell what is now, what is the rec the Hevasor doing now in Rojava? What are your main issues? Okay. Uh, so we started with few people, 2012. Again, we are still not part of uh, the Red Cross, but we have uh, coordination, let's say, somehow o also in high level, uh, thankfully. Uh, but now with the support of different donors, the first one was ECO, European Union, and it was 2016, they support us when we were working in Raqqa. Uh, but somehow we felt that um, as Kurdish Red Crescent, now we are working as uh, 2,000 people in this NGO. We are step by step, which is was not in our intention, to uh, s replacing the health system or the health department, which is wrong. Uh, as the colleagues before were saying, I think we always have to support the local government or the local community to, to, to work something. It's not NGO territory or it's not 
yeah. um, our task to be there. It's their task to make, uh, for example, Kurdish Red Crescent can do emergency when there is COVID, when there is attack, military attacks, when there is uh, any emergency or pandemic, but it's not there to replace the rot uh, vaccina uh, routine vaccination, it's not there to replace the primary health care, it's not there to even to take care of the rest of the let's say secondary or tertiary health level. And it's not its capacity as well. I think no NGO mm -hmm. can do it. Mm -hmm. You are working in the uh, refugee camps. There are a lot of IDPs because of the attack from Turkey to Afrin to Serekaniye. Uh, can you tell me something or tell us something about your work in the refugee, in the IDP camps? Yeah, there is uh, almost 10, ten uh, camps and uh, mm -hmm. there are Syrian and not Syrian people, mainly Iraqis, but also international, as I said, former uh, ISIS families, women and children. We are working mainly on health and protection in all these camps, and as I said before, the, the biggest camp is al Hol camp, which is 60,000 people, and uh, we are doing other activities as well, like uh, in protection, in wash, and so on. We are not interfering in education, but it's, I think, one of the most important things because we are really sad for, for the children who are born from ISIS father, that they grow up in al whole camp. I, I think you were also there and th th how they will grow up. They don't have chance to, to educate well and they, have, they only get this um, feeding on how to be radical Muslim which is very sad. And it's beyond the self-administration capacity. They make many uh, rehabilitation centers. We are also supporting with Medico, Germany and Medico, Swiss also. But it's never enough. It's too much and there is really big need for rehabilitation, for awareness to, um, to stop this mentality to, to grow up between, between them. Um, yeah, but this is mainly for, for some camps, and unfortunately there are many European that their country doesn't accept to bring them back. Mm -hmm. uh, for Syrian and Iraqis, somehow when the, the tribe or the family bring them, they can re-educate or so on. But with the European, it's difficult to, to keep them, and yeah, they are still there in two camps, mainly. Yeah, you spoke about the whole camp. And we put this photo on our bulta, and now you told me this is the nurse who was killed in Al Hol camp by ISIS uh, people. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, there are more attacks to uh, Kurdish Red Crescent from drones. Or can you tell me something about this? Yeah, actually, this attack. Uh, this is the only case. Actually, the colleague who was. Uh, died by, by ISIS, and in the same day also, it was in al Hol camp, there was the Red, uh, International Red Cross also clinic there, also they were under attack with the um, with knife. So, um, when, mm. when it's all connected, when something happened outside, also the people inside al Hol they have this, uh, let's say, commitment or coordination uh, with outside. So there was some attacks on uh, the prison or the detention center in Haseke, and this happened in the same time. And, and by Turkish airplanes? Yeah, and in, in the attacks of, or when there is a military offensive, <coughs> usually you put the, the sign of the crescent or cross, other, other partners also putting the signs, but it's not only the Kurdish crescent who were uh, under the attack, for example, other partners, uh, and they published German Kados, their ambulance also wa was under attack. And not only the ambulances, but also the health facilities. There was a big report from WHO and how many facilities were uh, attacked uh, from both sides, actually, not only from Turkey, but, but our fear is always like for, um, as our NGO is uh, Turkey, and because we are still not recognized, so, but as I say, we are following the uh, ICRC principles, but they don't, they don't see. So you have no protection. And I want to go a little very small uh, uh, excursion to mental health. I was working in mental health with the staff of uh, Red Crescent. 
And also with uh, caretakers working in the COVID hospital, with uh, war injured men, they have like lost a leg or an arm. And I saw that the people is really very stressed. Many people is very stressed. And this ongoing feeling of um, helplessness sometimes, it's the, the hardest thing for the people. I remember that one of the nurses of uh, Heivasor told me she was in Afrin when Turkish military attacked and the Chihedi militia attacked Afrin and she saw injured uh, children, little children, and she wanted to go to rescue them and there was a drone ongoing, um, I think firing, that she cannot cross to save the children until the children were dead. Then they left the place and she could cross and rescue but the dead bodies of the children. And I think for her it was a horrible moment to be wit witnessing somebody dying and you cannot do anything and you want to help them. So these, these experiences uh, left like deep scars in the, in, in the people I met. This feeling of ongoing attacks, ongoing in safety, ongoing not knowing what is the future, mainly if they have children. It's more difficult because you don't know how will be the future of my children. It um, provokes a huge migration to Germany <laughs> overall. Many people are thinking about how can I migrate to Germany and how, yeah, what is the way I can leave Rojava uh, in dangerous ways also through the Mediterranean Sea. So they, some of them died in the Mediterranean Sea. So it's a really very difficult situation of the people there. And when I was there, it was still COVID time, so we could not make groups in the IDP camps. It was impossible. But we managed a little bit to, yeah, to give strength and a resistance power to the people. And I think on the other side, um, the feeling we are fighting for a better future, we are fighting for our uh, project of democ basic democratic organization of self-administration, this, um, uh, yeah, this aim, this, uh, this idea, this collective fight, it gives a lot of strength to the people and it strengthens the resistance, the, the psychological resistance of the people. Yeah, I, I add something also here in, in the camp, maybe I told you also that um, many of them are still families of, of ISIS, the wives or so on. Mm -hmm. And sometimes our nurses, the brother or the cousin or so on is victim, former victim of ISIS. So it's really tough to, to, to keep following like independent, very humanitarian and so on, even though they are doing, I mean, somehow we are learning. And uh, I think we, we skipped something that um, for us, I think in all North Syria and also for the Red, uh, Kurdish Red Crescent, we are following the system that there is always co-director, like man and woman, you cannot have man alone. And uh, Talking about the Middle East, of course, the women usually and before, they didn't have the chance as, as the men, unfortunately, to be educated and so on. With the, let's say, the crisis in Syria, this was a chance and we benefited from the Kurdish movement to, to implement, implement this also in our system. And even though, for example, my co-director, um, she, she, she didn't have the chance to, for example, to go to university like me, but we learned that they have really important and uh, very unique power that they can do. And I think if, we, if I, I consider everything and I do everything, I will take care only on the technical side. And always I will choose the main people to, to do the task and skipping the, the woman. But then step by step when there is a woman beside me and deciding also, we always have this balance even though because if, if we are uh, going in this way, then we will never give the chance to the woman. And we are lucky and proud that more than 50% of our NGO is are, are women. So, yeah. And so, 
I yeah. think we have to go to, to some pictures. Uh, these are pictures to have an uh, impression how Hayward Dorakur is working, and you can make some comments, you see it. Yeah, this is, yeah. Uh, this is during attack. No. This is my co-director, by the way. I always mm -hmm. make a joke that... go uh, back, sorry. Here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is uh, Teltamer Hospital, Shahid Legrin Hospital, that uh, in the very front. You were there also, Maya? Yeah, I, I was there. It was the tech very close to the hospital. Uh, really, I was in fear. <laughs> so let's go a little bit quick. We don't have enough okay. time. Yeah, this is also... Uh, uh, the same, the same hospital, the same attack, and this I want to say that uh, she's, she was my co-director, and yeah, I, uh, as I was saying, I always make a joke that I was sitting at the office and sending her to the front line, <laughs> uh, but uh, but <laughs> it was her her decision always. I mean, she's very brave and really yeah, she's really very brave, loved person, and this also I think important. Yeah. And this is her again. She she is a nurse, and this the person is Isis person, and this was in, in Membish time, 2017. And um, talking about the feminism and <laughs> so on, when, and this was during Ramadan time, uh, she wanted to treat him, and when he was hearing, she said, I don't want woman to touch me. Then she said, but, but it's not your decision anymore, you are here, mm -hmm. we, we will treat you, and we will decide who to touch you. Hmm. Yeah, this is also Raka, and this is in Afrin, and this is a father who is, um, it was an attack on school, and uh, yeah, this is his son that. Uh, Turkish, yeah. by Turkish, and by jihad by, in by Turkish, Turkish yes. drone. And this is Kobani uh, grave, I think all of, of you. all the yeah. killed fighters. Yeah. An IDP camp. Yeah, this is Washokani camp. This is yes. our awareness campaign teams. Is the whole awareness campaign about COVID? I think so. I yes. Think, yeah. Yeah. yeah, this I think was the project with Medico and uh, it was distributing water in Haseke, which was the water of Euphrates was cut off on that city. It's the same project. These are all injured fighters. I think uh, Hevasor also is built up a prosthetic workshop to provide prosthetics for all these people. It's a huge need for this. But, but it's not only fighters, Maya. There yeah. is a lot of civilians. And also. a lot of civilians. Yeah. <laughs> but the former picture were fighters. Yeah. We have one. Uh, prosthetic worker. Prosthetic. Yeah, a lot of children. Yeah, this also, I remember her, her name was Sarah. She lost her leg in, in also an attack from Turkey and in, in Kamshni city. Sh her brother was died and she, she lost her leg. And the last pictures, the COVID hospital. This is uh, one of the response that KRC was doing, uh, COVID hospital. And again, I want to just comment here that you mentioned that uh, it's true, we were really in need of health staff at that time. And as you mentioned, many doctors, nurses are leaving because of the situation, especially recently. In Germany alone, there is more than 5,000 Syrian doctors now. It's a huge number, which is bad for uh, North Syria. And we had to depend on, for the mild level of COVID, on the people to train them how to do the basic th things, because one nurse 24 hours cannot do everything. Okay. So assistance yeah. were needed. This is inside the hospital. One of the issues was to get enough oxygen, not medicaments, but oxygen. <laughs> yeah, cleaning stuff. I was working with these caretakers and cleaners to give them a little bit of support. Yeah, this is the caretakers. You see, we were working like in a very provisional way. It was cold. It was very cold. <laughs> so I think this, yeah, it's the last picture. <laughs> yeah, 
already said about that. The co-coordination, and I think one of the speciality of Rojava is that really they didn't ignore, or they go on with the feminist revolution, with the movement revolution, even there is war, attack, and many problems. Yeah, thank you very we much. We continue, we continue, we don't okay. break. You can have a seat here, maybe, uh, on the, here. Uh, thank you very much. Stuart, maybe you can join. And Lasha as well. And just um, thank you very much uh, for this present, for, for, for this talk, for uh, maybe we need another chair. Sherva, maybe just the first question from my side and then we'll shortly open up yes. to the floor. Um, yeah, thank you. What do you expect from the international community? Okay, I think <coughs> um, there was some part that we have to talk about, especially after the, the Ukrainian, Ukrainian war, Russian-Ukrainian war. And um, if we, we, we look at that, there was um, from different views, like politically, first of all, Yeah, uh, politically after the Ukrainian war, sorry, it's a little bit connected question. Um, all the, let's say, the international community are focusing on, on Ukraine, more or less. So, unfortunately, Turkey feels that they can't do anything in North Syria, and that's why they do a lot of attacks. The second point, and also it's not that priority as this point, um, is the donation or the support which was coming to North Syria. Uh, in terms of, let's say, not that big donors like ECHO or BHA or so on, but some municipalities on or, or so on. When many Ukrainians came to their uh, city, they say, okay, we cannot donate for you this year because we have this. So it impacted on us. And the last, and it's also very important to mention that uh, Syrian war is more than 10 years. And before the war in Ukraine, it was somehow on discussion how to go ahead with it. Uh, we have to find a solution. It's 10 years and that's enough. But now and after Russian-Ukrainian war, you can see again, it's not on the top priority and everybody on focusing on Ukraine, which is of course very important, but uh, the, this uh, case is somehow abandoned. Um, from international community, I, I am not in, in charge of to talk politically instead of the self-administration, but for example, for the Kurdish Red Crescent, we are dif facing a lot of di difficulties because of the we are not recognized by the uh, Red Cross. And this is also, we know it's not uh, something that they want, but we know it's according to international humanitarian law, it's not accepted to have two crescent or two cross in the same country, and there is already Syrian red crescent, mm -hmm. and it's always uh, blocked or interfered with the Syrian government. Um, so this is one point. The other point, and I was mentioning some months ago, the Catalan parliament recognized the self-administration. This opens the borders or the gates for many agencies in Catalonia to support more North Syria and so on. And I am talking about North Syria, not <laughs> Syria. So I think this kind of steps, if we're done, could be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Stuart, do you know it's uh, uh, Switzerland engaged still in Syria? Yes. From with humanitarian yes. aid, I suppose. Yeah, we have an office. Uh, we have an office in Syria and we also have cross-border uh, operations. And you collaborate uh, with uh, a Kurdish question, do you know? I don't know. Red question. We, we had one project, but I think we are the refugee project, the main program in North Syria. We have one project. You have to give him the, the mic just oh, because yeah. for the people on the stream in the stream. Yeah, we, we already get the support um, from SDC. Uh, it was two years ago, and I think it was for two years, uh, through an Italian partner on Ponte Per. And uh, then the health program was stopped or s somehow I we understood like that and uh, not priority as before in North Syria for SDC. Yeah, there is, there is a health project with, I with an NGO, I think it's Medair, that carries on at the moment in North Syria. 
Um, it's a long, a long running mm -hmm. project. So, so we do, and we are involved at the moment with the um, outbreak of cholera. Um, we are sending material mm -hmm. um, to UNICEF for the for the response there. So, the, the I mean, it's 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 not it's it's not uh, off the radar. And uh, just also to say that um, previously the war the war in Ukraine started in 2014. So. So there was there was humanitarian operations in Ukraine, um, and there was also humanitarian operations in in Syria. And Syria Syria was the focus uh, for a long time um, before the current uh, invasion uh, started in in February. So there there is a shift in, shift in focus, and this is humanitarian aid uh, uh, going to where the, the greatest needs are. That's that's our humanitarian imperative. Thank you, Remco. Can I say some? Uh, just a moment. I think to mention that the Stadt Zurich, the city of Zurich, by a political initiative of leftist parties, supported um, through Medico International Switzerland the mobile clinics and the water, uh, water um, distribution in the IDP camps and in the villages where the IDPs were living. Uh, this was really a very successful project with the city of Zurich. Thank you. Remco? May yeah. I just, uh, I would like to open up because we don't have so much time so that the people... Well, this is, an, uh, uh, thank you, and it's very enriching always to hear these different contexts. Um, I've worked uh, as well in, in, in humanitarian settings and health and conflict, mainly with medicine in Monde, and so I, I recognize the, <coughs> the dilemmas as well, and I think that the dilemma here is also for humanitarian actors. Are we also changing the status quo if this is about uh, direct democracy and, and justice and human rights approaches because there's an action there but there's also an action here for instance when it comes to refugees and acceptance in Europe and we've seen what happened last year in Afghanistan where the, the western community retrie retrieved quite quickly and many people f feel abundant so can you can you also say something about perhaps what we should do in Switzerland and Europe to make it more sustainable and just on the long term, all these solidarity actions that we now also make in relation to climate and health um, and to, yeah, to, to sustain it, so to say. <coughs> it's a difficult one, but maybe it's, it's an open reflection for the, for the panel. Who dares? I think maybe you could slightly clarify what you mean by what we can do in Switzerland, because we do. I mean, we 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 do uh, we are changing our the way that we that we implement our programs through this nexus approach and ACC. So we are, we are working on yeah, that. So, so I think I it's this I maybe it's more it's specifically who it is. Exactly. It is this nexus between uh, humanitarian aid and development. So what will happen if the if the um, if the war will stop in Ukraine, uh, and how to sustain then also Swiss uh, um, um, collaboration with Ukraine, and also also to ensure that the Ukraines that are now very welcome to uh, to Switzerland and Europe um, are also able to do that 10 and 20 years from now on. And the, the international community can be very hypocrite in, th in this regard, uh, as we have seen over the years. So that's a little bit the the, mm. the question: how to sustain and keep political engagement over time without yeah, being very ambiguous, so to say. Well, I, I think that's I think that's the case of the programming, and I think that was the example I showed that we have this long-running program over many years to assist the Ukrainian government to reform their their uh, their de and their decentralization pro process. So that's a long-running program <laughs> that still exists now that will still exist uh, in, in the future. Um, the the support for teaching in in uh, health. Um, supported by ACC, that w that is that is ongoing. It's been adjusted according to the reality of the needs of the humanitarian needs. Trauma rehabilitation for it would be an example that will continue um, on into the future. So I th I think Ukraine is an example of where ACC has a long term previous commitment, has a present uh, commitment adjusted to the current reality, and will continue in the future. I give the word to Fabian Schumacher from Medicus Mundi, Italy. <laughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to ask uh, Thomas. Uh, on on uh, There was now a coup, a uh, military coup about six weeks ago in Burkina, and I would like to know 
did you feel any impact on your work by this, or is it just that everybody is uh, going on hmm. normally? Hmm. How is your relation with ministries, and how is it with the people in the field? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hopefully, we don't have a huge impact currently. Uh, the ministry uh, is still working on the daily business is uh, still ongoing and not affected. So we still be able to work and to have session with the ministry. Uh, and the ministry of health is still the same. Th th is, uh, it, it has not been removed. So it's kind of continuum. And we don't have a huge impact mm -hmm. at this moment uh, about this coup. So we will see what, ab what uh, the next are the next steps. But hopefully, we, we don't have a, a huge impact uh, with th the second coup. <laughs> I have half it with a comment or question. I think it just turned into a comment. It's more or more an, an I, um, reflection that's been accompanying me now for the last years is, so what, again, the question to what would be our role in the future? And um, so many thoughts, I'll try to, to keep it <laughs> precise. So one thing is the urgency to coordinate more our advocacy work. Our advocacy work because the decisions taken on budgets and where the budgets are diverted to um, are often taken, we are in a democratic system, democratically it takes time. And parliaments will shift over the next years, but we can do a lot to send stars our societies. Um, thing is, do we do it jointly? And do we have a strategic a strategy in doing this? Or are you doing a bit and we are doing a bit and everyone is a bit? We, we know what's right, but I think at the end, I think we will need more um, joint strategies to influence the public, sensitize the publics, to, in to influence and sensitize our parliaments to take such decisions. And I think that really is a need and a role we can play in the future. Um, that's one, and, I, and the, the, the other thought that I had on, um, on the urgency to just take decisions and to listen more to science, I agree, but please let's remember that we need to find a balance between listening to science and not turning into technocrat societies. We still have democratic processes, societal processes to take care of. It's not that easy, um, and, and um, yeah, in all these debates, Listening to science is crucial, but we still live in a con political context. Thank you. Comment? Does somebody want to... Uh, Lasha, do you want to react uh, to this? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, science, of course, is an integral part of the, the joint uh, movement. Uh, I mean, academia is really... Uh, need to be... Uh, we need to be together, but uh, of course, definitely, I mean, we need to respond to the vulnerabilities, uh, increased vulnerabilities uh, without waiting years and ages, for sure. Uh, and this, uh, yeah, and also, you see, science, we have to wait science, we have to wait the political decisions, it takes time, etc. So, yeah, definitely, we need to find the ways and mechanisms to, to, uh, to stronger advocate for the, for the faster, faster action. Uh, yeah, and also, I mean, one uh, crisis, as, as you just mentioned, should not really be the reason to forget another uh, type of vulnerabilities, and we can list many that exist today. So, which one is priority? So, how how to define? Thank you very much. I will close here this session for a very short break for ten minutes, and then we will have. Uh, uh, a shorter but a very hot, spicy debate for closing this, uh, uh, for today's symposium. Three are okay, three Stühle for nachher.
Um, yes, we are back in the room. I promised you um, a, a spicy last panel. And that it is spicy, we need as well you. You have really to contribute again here in these last moments uh, of this symposia and bring your reflection, what you've learned today, what you have, uh, uh, what surprised you today, and just bring it in. And I ask now Olivier, uh, Olivier Bra from SDC, um, Hoffi Derbal, we know him already, and we have Christina de Vries uh, from Corday, Netherlands. So we have a little bit the more European panel here. And please have a seat. Maybe we take you in the middle and I just wanted to start with uh, uh, with you, Christina. Now, from a Dutch perspective, and as well maybe a Cordate perspective, do you experience any shifts in fundings uh, through the new this war this year in the Ukraine against Ukraine? You need to take this one. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for the question. Um, I work with. Coordate, which is a double mandate organization, meaning that we do relief and development. And uh, we also do advocacy on global health and, and on human rights in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, yes, there's a, a massive shift of um, funding for relief at the expense of development. Um, and um, so that's that's w that's um, that's a concern because not only from the Dutch government or from European governments, but also from global institutions like the World Bank and and IMF and um, other institutions. There has been a, a big pause, let's say, for uh, funding programs in um, in in many low and middle income countries. And we see now also a shift away from um, attention for the, the fragile and the conflict countries, because there's much more business to do actually with the middle income countries. Okay. Hafid, uh, you, um, I think you have experienced similar things with uh, partners, you have told me some time ago, and maybe you can tell us this Zimbabwe example you have, and I think... Uh, yeah, but I will... What, what yeah, I when you were talking, I was just like, what the privileged place we will we work in, uh, because I'm, we, we criticize a lot, we challenge each other a lot, but where I, I really want to underline as well how thankful I am, because we often, in the last two years, we thought about how major donors in Switzerland have increased some budgets. But most importantly, they have not, they have given quite early the security that the budget spoken during this pandemic were still there. And we could also give that security to partners of saying, hey, the core funding and, and systems and structures we've invested in for years, we're not just taking away that money. That security, again, is really a big thank you from our side because it, it gave some, not only planning security, but existential security for many of the partners. Um, and it came to that discussion when, in Zimbabwe, we work with a women's rights uh, organization doing um, coordinating or advocacy work around sexual reproductive health and rights. And um, they received, end of, end of May, um, they received an official letter from um, CEDA, the Swedish, um, Swedish agency, saying that unfortunately there was a strategic restructuring, re, um, re-diversioning of, of funding going now to the Ukraine and that they had, they would still receive money up until the end of June, that's five weeks. And, and then you, you're there, you have projects, you had to gain, you know the work on the field, right? you had to gain trust of the communities, you need to develop structures and, and now you have to just rethink everything. Um, and, and 
Yeah, so um, I think th th it was quite alarming. We tried to help where we could, at least to keep functional, like um, the com their communication officer that is key in the advocacy work, um, not to lose that person. And again, you invest years into building up the structures and it takes one quick decision to um, just let it fall. Uh, Olivier, how do you handle this from, from SDC side, uh, side? There was now, um, during, quiet, during the pandemic years, we are probably still in it, but we are in another phase, but in this uh, first two years, uh, I think uh, for global health, quite a lot was possible as well from resources side. So uh, SDC and Switzerland is engaged very much in uh, uh, in different uh, uh, programs. Uh, a lot, quite a lot of resources could be mobilized within Switzerland, and but now it changes again. So uh, how is it for you to deal with these uh, these changes within? Uh, within uh, the way the money flows as well within your direction, uh, with your, uh, within your agency. And uh, what do you think, where, where could this lead to? In which direction are we now heading uh, in, in, in financing of Swiss uh, uh, development cooperation? Thank you. Well, uh I mean, for SDC, and when we talk about and we think about how the partners we deal with uh, plan the work, predictability of funding is essential, like you said, uh, Afit. Huh? Um, and, and this is why, uh, as you know, we, we operate under a four-year budget and we do middle to long-term commitment with the partners in order to, to allow that kind of predictability of funding. Now, to, to your question, Martin, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's difficult for, for an official development agency to think in a kind of 15, 20 years perspective in terms of development and at the same time dealing with poti political change uh, locally as well nationally that, that reorient the priorities. Very concrete example, during the COVID pandemic 2021, uh, because of the COVID pandemic impact and, and its importance in all of, of our everyday life, uh, we, we were able to mobilize additional funding for, for the global COVID response from the parliament no, with not affecting the regular budget. Huh? So, so that was very a response on biomedical response, let's say, huh? uh, focusing on distribution of vaccines, uh, diagnostics and therapies, R&D and so on. Um, and at the end, very concretely speaking, at the end of, of the beginning of this year, 2020, in January, let's say, um, we knew that, that, the, the, that the needs for the post-COVID-19 pandemic recovery would need uh, investment in other sectors than biomedical response only. And we were ready uh, to, to, to launch new cooperation focusing on local production of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of goods, of medical products as well, but as well on, on other sectors. So we were ready to go to, to Parliament and to ask for an added kind of third special credit for that, for the post-pandemic 19 uh, recovery, and, and eventually the, the, the Ukraine outbreak uh, came and uh, the political priority was different. So the, the message we got from our head of department, from uh, our minister was, guys, uh, I think now the priority is different, that's Ukraine, so let's, let's have to mobilize <coughs> that money there. So yes, it's, it's, it's definitely a, a challenge we will be facing. The next coming is all the discussion we, we, we are involved in the pand pandemic preparedness and response that are going on nowadays. Uh, you saw the J20 initiative to mobilize additional money around that. Uh, uh, what does that mean concretely? If do we have additional money? If not, shall we uh, reprogram within existing uh, uh, program we have uh, at the bilateral level? That's all discussion we have to follow uh, mm -hmm. in this coming months. Mm -hmm. How is it on the European level? How is EU behaving? Do you have an idea, or is it a problem for Cordate? Uh, or what are the challenges for Cordate in this way, in this regard? The EU is still in the process of designing its global health um, strategy. I, I think uh, in yeah this month month they will publish the first draft, and then. Um, there is there's no opportunity anymore to influence uh, the e EU health strategy. 
uh, we hope that um, there will be um, an, an opportunity uh, next year in the first quarter when the European Council is presided by Sweden and that we will then, as NGOs, have an influence on the operationalization of the EU global health strategy. For instance, um, yeah, we, we, dis we discussed just on, on Monday that most global health strategies have of European countries do not have any milestones or a monitoring framework. Well, if we can get that in at the EU, then at least we can keep them accountable for any progress or any budget that they actually put to the words. The global health strategy um, for is very often um, actually designed for national interests and it's not always, um, so there are many actors, um, it's not always clear what is inside global health and what is outside global health and what the principles are. So it's not always about human rights, it's not always about sustainable development goals, um, it's sometimes about uh, health security for our own country. It's sometimes also about um, export for health commodities and, and pharmaceuticals. So there are many actors, many interests that get into global health policies. Um, and it's not just a development issue anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes, so this is similar i think to uh, switzerland's health foreign policy uh, where we see a little bit the same same uh, issues it's a comparable this this strategy let's come back to the crisis Hafi, before i open up the, the floor i just keen want to hear you as have you you have a lot of contacts through your programs with young people uh, you have presented today as well the, your uh, institutional reaction on, on, on climate change. Uh, when you talk with young people in Zimbabwe with your program partners, what is their perspective on the crisis uh, the world is now and these different crises we have as, as climate degradation, uh, as, as conflict and wars? What do you... Do you Talk about this and what, what comes back. Um, I do talk, but I'm very careful to say this is what the Zimbabweans, Zimbabwean youth think. Very, very, very careful. But um, um, I'll take a, s a step back. We have, in we have international delegates from every country as well. So Tanzania, Zimbabwe, um, Mozambique is very fair established, El Salvador as well, and in um, some other countries the, the structure is underway. But where the youth, I can say, are already vocal and at a stage where they can really participate and really take part in the discussion, these are the some countries. Um, first thing is, I think that what... Um, I grew up in Algeria and I have a lot of contact there, just to... Um, the war in Ukraine is not as present for many parts of the world as it is here for several reasons. It is present in the case that fuel prices, oil prices um, are, are getting higher. But in terms of um, the degree of security that we have lost here, and this is now the Swiss Hafid who is talking because my kids are also here, and of course I have, I have fears and insecurities, it's, it's another stake. Um, in terms of perception of crisis, I don't want to be too placative, but in terms of the perception of crisis, many of the youth and vulnerable youth we work with in the context of rural Zimbabwe, in the context of the AIDS pandemic that we still have, um, crisis is, and, and dealing and coping with crisis is part, is not something new, it's just you have faces. And um, I'll try to give an answer to say um, what, I, what I find hopeful is that y when you give the floor, when you give the tools and the meanings to the young people, it's very inspirational. They, they develop their own strategies jointly, individually, to cope with those crises. That's one. And then second, what I 
find, because for me it's always, despite all the differences that you can find, what brings us together? And um, I, was, I was really surprised, I didn't assume that, I was surprised that the climate question is indeed something that comes up everywhere. I did not take that for granted. Mm. Um, but it comes, not everywhere I don't want to say, but at least in the context we work with, is a topic that comes up again and again and again. Um, if this is a really, I was careful uh, how to answer on this because I d there is no straight answer yeah, to yeah, this. Yeah, but thank you, interesting. Uh, I want to ask here in the room, uh, what, what are your reflections uh, faced with this different crisis? What do you think will change as well for our, for our uh, uh, field of work, for international cooperation, uh, for global health? Uh, one year ago, we would have been probably a little bit optimistic. Yes, global health is back on stage. We know the importance, but this changed now everything uh, again. So what, what do you think? What could change? Where, where are we moving to? Who dares to just uh, give opinion or statements on this whim? Thank you. Um, th the fascinating, or perhaps not so fascinating thing, is that uh, for 35 years I hear exactly the same discussion about the difference between humanitarian help and development. I think we're both at a dead end. Uh, we will stop it all and do something totally different. What I find uh, also uh, difficult is that when I hear Remco talk about social justice, about equity, and about how the system should change, the only movement that I see going forward is typically neoliberal capitalistic, and that is where you have new funds uh, that start up not by doing projects, but by grant making. So uh, they take investors, they put money forward, and then local organizations can ask for a loan or something like that. And that is helping, and there's something going on there that I think we should all be very careful, not careful, that we should be very curious about to find out how that works. But it is exactly the other thing from what we have been thinking all the time, is that we would move in more like a, a, a commons lab direction. And that commons, uh, that's also very interesting, but that, that is exactly that's in my own backyard. I mean, I haven't seen anything international happening from the commons as far, but I would hope that uh, something would come up. But that is a question that I would have. When, uh, it's, it's just like with climate wars, you know, the people say, oh, in the future there will be climate wars. We are in the middle of climate wars. Darfur was a climate war. The Middle East is one big climate war. We keep uh, just as much in denial as we think that other people are. It's already happening. The Third World War is ongoing for the last 25 years, but we tend not to see it and we go on with exactly the same approach as we did since the Second World War. So I'm actually, uh, and I'm not blaming anybody else, I'm also blaming myself if you like, but I'm, I'm sometimes I'm stupefied by, by um, oh, let's talk about the difference between development work and humanitarian work. I mean, where did I hear that before? So how about... Um, changing the discussion. I mean, uh, shall we make an investment fund uh, or do we think that's too neoliberal? Yeah, or, or maybe change the, the persons who we talk to. Okay, I'll go. <laughs> 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 no, I like to listen to you, Willem. <laughs> but uh, for instance, if you look at the Dutch global health uh, p policy that is just published, you know, 95% of that policy is paid by Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Health has only put a meager 5% to that budget. And if we talk, uh, there's a lot of talk about One Health, but there's zero of Ministry of Agriculture. There is, uh, there's a lot of talk about health security, zero from the Ministry of Defense. There are more receivers than that they actually contribute. Um, so it, it remains, th the whole discussion remains in, in with, the, with the old actors and with the old systems. So I agree, how do we, how do we get out of those silos? But maybe you have a good example. Yeah, this is a good, uh, Olivia, just to combine it with, because when you say this, we have a system, this is called the Agenda 2030 of the UN, it's the SDGs, so um, Olivier, uh, how is uh, Swiss administration handle this, not silosing, uh, not remaining in the silos and really break up uh, and they come into a uh, uh, SDG thing, the way of thinking? Well, you know, um, I believe and many of my colleagues do believe that already the SDGs, it's, it's, it's already a bit 
all this story because SDGs they identify objective per specific thematic, you know, on the wash, on equitable access, on uh, and basically when when the more we discuss with practitioner we understand that we should not engage on one specific thematic intervention only, but try to to reach over overall outcomes in terms of development in 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 a kind of uh, intersectorial approach. So I think that as long as as development agencies, including the SDC, is organized around delivering on specific themes, maybe we might not going on on the right way. Coming to what our, our colleague said, uh, uh, you know without being philosophical, uh, as you said, but in a, in a neoliberal way, we do live in the development aid business has been, uh, is clearly the mirror of that and has been kind of contaminated or, or influenced by that way, that way of thinking. If, if you look at the way we do have to report on results, we talk about development, we have to report on, on yearly basis activities. We do uh, operate with uh, annual or four years budget on long-term development ideas and projects. So uh, even on that single basis, we are not aligned mm -hmm. on the ambition we have and, and the means and the, the reporting, the reporting we have to, to, to give back to our constituency, the problem and the Swiss taxpayer. I have no, I have no solution, I'm just, yeah. it, it's always easy to just look at things and say it's not working. Let's think together. Yeah, very good. Uh, I get exactly where you, like, I'm, I'm absolutely in agreement with you, but I, I think still, um, for me, it's, it's also important to acknowledge that we're not where we were 35 years ago, and we, were n we are not where we were, we were 50 years ago in terms of how we do our work and in terms of how, um, where we are. I, I tend to think of one of the most inspir inspirational persons I met here in Basel, Hans Rosling, um, and to show that, yes, we are not good yet, but we are way better than we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I think there, and there is still much to do. Now on, and this is, I mean, the, the elephant that was addressed several times in the room. Of course, the economic system in which we work uh, in, and live and operate, um, we, we, we know that. And I think the, the powerlessness is, is how to ad to really address it. So we need still to work within. So we and are we really change changing it? I doubt it. Um, and on the other hand, is how do you how do um, societal transitions take place? And honestly, I I I don't see only pessimistic. I see risks in the future, but I see a couple of dynamics that are coming up. One is um, I'm not sure where the Ukraine war will result in terms of us as civil society realigning of saying, okay, what's important? How do we need to be prepared and defend our values? What are our values, etc.? So these discussions were getting lost here. Um, there is a new momentum in this. I don't know where it's going. The second one is, I don't know if how many pandemics it takes. So this was, this was one, but the f it's clear for everyone that the frequencies will raise. Um, Everyone was talking, there is a need for better governance at global level. What happened? Almost nothing. But I tend to think that the next pandemic will have then a next response. This is really where I see the transitions. We need to keep up the discussions. We need to keep up pointing fingers. This is our role. Um, and I see it as, on long term, how societal changes can and transformation can take place um, on a global scale. Do I want it to happen tomorrow? Yes. But I'm either not the right person to do it in a revolutionary way, it means break everything and do it tomorrow. Other actors may come, but it's really the, the big challenge and what role I can play and I will play. Thank you very much. A little bit more hopeful. Uh, this is helpful in this day where we tend to leave the room a little bit more depressed than in the morning. Uh, Thomas. Your word, and then we have to land because uh, uh, we have to land uh, really on time. So, uh, uh, thanks to all of you, and thanks to Willem, just reminding me where I was at that time, you know, collecting money for the anti imperialist struggle, of arms for the liberation movements in Mozambique and Angola. 
I think uh, when you are young, you have you, you have your visions and you have your dreams and you have this kind of violent thinking also that things need to change. We see the same violent thinking that things need to change today in the in the young people, just shaking us and say you cannot continue to to do as you have done. You will kill our world if you don't act on climate change. It's all always about justice. It's always about re self reflection about what is our specific responsibility to make things change. And I don't mind if this is if this leads always again to some, you can call it uh, hopeless dreams, you know, like uh, as, as John Lennon say, told us, but you have to see that some of those dreams get, uh, get true and uh, for all prices. What I would not like to see is NGOs making climate change to their business case. Because it's nice to attract the young generation, because it's good to get some new money from the development cooperation agency of the country, because you might find a, a kind of a, of a market for fundraising at, at the broader audience. No, but I would love, and I have seen it today and I heard it, the honesty that this is where we have to reflect about our own role and responsibility. And for me, that's good enough. And then I think let's, let's continue to learn from each other. Let's continue to share. Let's continue to walk our way where we are. And I don't mind if there is a bit of repetition as long as this honesty is there and there is a direction and a bit of optimism, you know, that we, we still plant trees, even if, it, if the time is difficult. Thank you. This yes, yes I, I agree. And I think um, many traditional um, societies and, 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 and people living in rural areas, they know how to protect the environment. We don't need to uh, develop a program there. We need to talk to our own societies in the north and um, because we have to change and um, we are part of the problem. So for instance, I, I heard something about uh, luxury medicine. I, I think that, that turns people off if you use that term, but there is a kind of comfort medicine. But there's also who, who actually decides which medicines are going to be developed, which are going to be produced, where are they going to be produced, uh, for whom. So it's logical that the pharmaceutical industry builds business cases, but I think our governments actually need to be much stronger on what do we need for public health, uh, what makes sense uh, in terms of research and production, and where are the limits of our health systems. It's ridiculous that we are actually uh, promoting migration of health workers from the south to the north. Um, because maybe we have a lot of vacancies, but uh, there are many, many more vacancies in, in, in the weak health systems in, in the south. We should be exporting, well, I don't know if we should export the kind of people we have here. But <laughs> <laughs> we sh I, think we, uh, I won't finish that argument. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'm glad that you stopped as well with an op optimistic uh, perspective. Uh, we should stick to our dreams. This was it from my side. I can hand over to, to um, uh, Jacques Marder for some last reflections. <coughs> he maybe he doesn't want, but he has to now. Uh, we, we, forced him, we forced him a little bit. Uh, um. <laughs> Thank you to the panelists. Yes, Jutro Martin, I didn't want to make the wrap up. I even proposed to have some young people to make the wrap up, but unfortunately, we didn't manage to find a person and I, it's very unfortunate. So you get uh, an old white man again. I'm sorry for <laughs> that, but I cannot really change. So um, I will make a very long wrap up because I have four pages and I heard that people have to take a train. <laughs> so I will just grab a few quotes if you agree. I don't pretend to summarize. Huh? It's just a few things which uh, struck me. Uh, the first thing is a definition of planetary health, which is a public health with within planetary boundaries. I like that one. Thank you, Remco. <coughs> Yes, multiple crises deepen uh, inequities. 
and the limits to growth here, yeah, why didn't we really act? We thought we could innovate and resolve the challenges 50 years ago. And it's exactly the same now with climate change. A big part of the population thinks, oh, we'll manage to solve, we'll develop technology, and we, we will manage to suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere and things like that. So we don't learn much. Post-growth, degrowth, what's really for sure is infinite growth on a limited planet is just an illusion, or even worse, a lie. So then uh, we saw an example on the growth-induced catastrophe with externalities not compensated, the RRC. It's a tragedy, and it's a tragedy will, which will last for long. And shame to all those who were involved in that, and thank you for those who invest and try to make the best out of this difficult situation. Then uh, we had... Uh, uh, Ah, we had a, a politician, a Swiss politician, which was really good. And, uh, well, he's, he asked us what's the right things to do, and he had, fortunately, an example to show us of right things to do. Uh, but uh, <laughs> there are so many other examples where we know what is the right things to do and nothing happens. So how to make the right things to do happen? He didn't give us the answer, but maybe we should invite him again next year and... <laughs> Let's see. Uh, then the pharma is moving towards net zero. I would really appreciate to see how they calculate their carbon footprint. <laughs> but that's another <laughs> question. And we heard very often the fact that, oh, it's very complex, and uh, the answer, answer is not easy. That's a smoke screen. And uh, it's a way to say, OK, don't look too much at that. The pharma should, uh, for instance, publish the, their figure how much they really actually invest in research and development and how much of public funds go in research and development. That would be very useful for the debate. Uh, <coughs> then we had this uh, revision of COVID in Africa and, uh, well, a few myths and uh, to understand that uh, one size doesn't fit all. It's very pleasant to hear that because we speak about Africa, which is such a huge continent, so fortunately one size doesn't fit all, and we should listen to local actors. Here again, 50 years ago, we already said that. Are we still uh, listening? I'm not so sure. How to change perspectives, circumvent government in action, work on alternative societal model, give priority to prevention, promotion. Yes, of course, we, we can only agree with those proposals, but how can we start and where do we start? <coughs> Sorry. How to balance the short-term benefit with long-term environmental impact. I witnessed that when I was in Africa and that, uh, that was the introduction of all these uh, smartphone tablets and all those things and these mountains of, uh, of uh, dead uh, electronics. Uh, well, then we had uh, Terdism Swiss with a passionate, uh, thank you, Hafid, for <laughs> your presentation. And you said something which gave me to think. With you said, <coughs> first of all, there's an organizational goal, which is great, 50% uh, uh, reduction of the emission by 2030, which is, by the way, the Paris Agenda. It's excellent that you decide to, to go there but then you need to have a very thorough carbon, uh, carbon footprint analysis and to know where your carbon footprint is, uh, is produced. And then <coughs> you asked a question which I find interesting, where and who do we want to be 15 years from now? And that's a question we should ask ourselves more uh, um, regularly. And we should also ask ourselves where were we and who were we four years ago, and what's different? And, and if it's so different, then what do we do with that? What do we do and what do we learn and, and where do we start from? I don't have the answer, but if I think uh, Medicus Mundi Symposium four years ago, the questions we had were so different and the horizon and the perspective were so different. So that was a, a, an important point. Then we had Alan, who spoke about uh, this Calcutta rescue and gave us some very concrete way forward. <coughs> Excuse me, I have some cold. 
and uh, not notably the importance of the leadership to change behavior and thinking, and the NGOs as torchbearer, that's great. I really think we have a, a role to play, more important even with climate change, and use toolkits and frameworks because they exist, so let's be very concrete. Then we had all the part on humanitarian aid, and I was very touched by all the testimonies and the engagement of the people. Fantastic what's done here. Kurdish Red Crescent, congratulations. You really work in a, in a difficult environment, and then you don't have any recognition, any protection, so it's fantastic. That's all I can say. And it's great that you find your way despite all those difficulties. And then LASHA, the International Federation, is now in climate change, looking at all the consequences and the displacement. And we know that the, all the political tensions are created by this question of displacement, because we all know that part of, the, of this planet will no longer be habitable. And then where the people will go? <laughs> they will come where it's habitable. And that's why I guess the extreme right parties are gaining momentum because they <laughs> try to build walls and to prevent all those movements. So that's where the Red Cross is an important role to play because you are very grounded, anchored in the, in the different countries. You can really play the go-between. You have a big network of volunteers. So I'm, very, I'm, I'm really supportive of the Red Cross, not, not only uh, because I've been working for them, but I'm still convinced that it's a very important organization. Then working in different contexts like ADM or, well, we see in all this question of security that's completely new. But the big, 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 big elephant in the room, and again, it's, uh, it's uh, climate change. And here we won't escape, but climate change is not a crisis. Climate change is something of another, another dimension. We are entering an uncharted territory we must live now with incertitude, and there are so many tipping points and unknown in that, that if we do not manage to create a new social contract, and if we do not manage to revive a multilateral platform where we can agree at the minimum on the reaction, I'm not extremely optimistic. So I'm sorry because Thomas has tried to turn the things positive, <coughs> but for me it's a bit difficult. But I think, again, with the NGOs and the involvement and the engage engagement of all of us, we can move the things. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Jacques Madar. Uh, I will do it extremely quickly. Uh, three information, uh, we will put the PowerPoints on the website. We have a paper evaluation, please fill it in, and I will send it tomorrow electronically. And we will have a special MMS uh, bulletin uh, of the symposium in spring. Uh, to you all, I want uh, speakers, participants here in Basel and online, Thank you so much uh, for your multiple and inspiring contributions, your productive interactions. Um, we hope really that you enjoyed the symposium as, what, as much as we did. And I want also to thank especially the Technic uh, team, uh, Nicola, Amelie for the chat and uh, taking care of uh, our online speakering and especially for our moderators, Sarah and uh, Martin, of course, and uh, Martina and Martin for all the organization of this symposium and the help uh, to, to do it. So, <laughs> it's not true. <finished. laughs> so, <laughs> so um, we hope that uh, you did enjoyed it as much as we do and you will bring all these interesting in, uh, inputs in your activities and that they will be helpful, helpful. and uh, wishing you a lovely evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>